I wanted to share an experience that still freaks me out just thinking about it. Just down the road from where I used to live a few years ago in southeast Australia is the opening into about a hundred acres of woodland and bush. I frequently went in there when I was younger to do the usual things, riding and camping, etc. I was out driving at about 11.30 p.m. with my girlfriend, and as we were in the area, I decided to show her the woodlands while we were there. She loves everything to do with nature, and it was summer, so it was extremely warm. I left my car with the lights shining into the trees as we weren't going in too far, and it was pitch black inside. The two of us just sat, having a smoke, chatting, and generally relaxing. She was sitting on a sort of map of the area that had been put in some plastic, and I was keeping an eye on the trees as I had a feeling that something was just wrong. I've read stories before about people who felt like they were in danger, even though nothing around them was perceptibly off, and this was that same feeling. Every sense was almost reaching out, and my adrenaline was up, but there wasn't really anything in my eye line that seemed any different. After lighting another cigarette to calm my nerves, I scanned the tree line again and realized that it looked different from before. It was only after staring into the darkness that I saw that there was moonlight, which was now lighting up grass. Before, it couldn't reach the grass, and it dawned on me that that was because there was a black shape blocking it. I assumed it was a tree. The only way that I can describe it was that all sound just ceased, and everything went dead silent. A few seconds later, this disgusting feeling of dread fell over me, and I saw motion in the dark of the path, as this thing crawled toward us on all fours. I've seen nearly every animal in the outback here, and we don't have any large predators like in the United States or Europe. But somehow, I knew this thing was a predator, and it wasn't hiding itself from us, just slowly crawling toward us. I don't know if my girlfriend saw it or not, as I couldn't look away, but just as it reached the line that my car lights were able to illuminate, it reared up onto two legs and just sat, staring at us. I'm 6'4", and this thing was about another meter taller than me, with arms that were far too long that reached down near the ground. All I could make out was an off-white, almost yellowish fur on it, and in the dim light, could make out the silhouette of its head as being that of a dog or a wolf. I wasn't able to move as it stared at me, but it was at this point that my girlfriend gasped, which seemed to break me out of whatever was stopping me from thinking logically. I grabbed her by the arm and we sprinted to the car, slammed the doors and tore out of there as fast as I could. Both of us were too scared to speak until about a half an hour later. We've both discussed it many times, and the feeling that we had was what I imagine a rabbit sees when it catches a wolf or a fox looking at it, that this is something that would be able to end us with absolute ease if it chose to. Neither of us have ever been able to come up with any explanation for what it was, but it has definitely changed the way I view the woods and bush when I go camping or hiking now. Every time I go out, I think back to that day, and I wonder what it was, and if I'll ever see it again. Newfoundland is an alien hotspot if the stories that I hear are any indication. Almost everyone I know has some story about when they lost huge chunks of time and were missing, usually for about a day, but it can go up to a week. I've never heard of any violent encounters, but a lot of I was frozen and couldn't move for a bit due to a light in the sky kind of stories. It's a pretty good assumption that if aliens do exist, they stalk my family. My dad has stories about being frozen on beaches, being watched in his sleep, and a weird story about the stars changing configuration. My mom has stories about meeting aliens, and she has a few accounts of what they look like. I might tell those stories one day, 
but I really feel like this is a good introduction to the types of encounters my family has had. For me, it all started when I was about 13. There's nothing overly remarkable about me, other than being in a military family, and I was more precocious than most. At the time, I was living in my dad's hometown, maybe a solid kilometer up the hill. My house was a raised bungalow, meaning that all the first floor windows were about 10 feet off the ground. My window faced the front yard, and was probably the only one that didn't have some kind of bush in front of it. Basically, I had a good solid view of my outside. One night, I remember being woken up fairly abruptly at around one in the morning. Not unusual for a 13 year old. So I thought, go get a drink, probably pee, go back to bed. Except when I tried to move, I couldn't. Some people describe the feeling of an overbearing weight that prevents them from moving. This wasn't that. It was like my whole body was asleep, complete with that tingly feeling and an utter lack of ability to move. I wasn't sleeping in a weird position, and aside from having maybe an extra blanket on the bed, I couldn't figure out a reason why this would be happening. The only thing I could move was my head, as my neck felt asleep, but not enough to completely prevent movement like the rest of my body. So I flopped my head to one side, and that's when I saw it. In my window, roughly in the middle, was a disc-shaped object. It hovered maybe a foot away from the glass and didn't move. This is remarkable for anyone who's been to Newfoundland, where 40 km per hour winds are the norm basically every day. The disc was maybe three feet in diameter, and the better part of a foot tall. It let off this low-grade, almost LED-like hue. It reminds me of those horrible blue Christmas lights. The thing had three thick, prominent ridges on what I assumed to be the front of it, which was facing me. From the middle one came a red light, and the thing didn't have a lens. It just kind of emanated from this thing. It split into a wide vertical pattern, and it's like it was scanning my body. When I moved my head, the disc was beaming around my belly button area. As soon as my head flopped with maybe a second or so delay, it moved the scanning laser to my eyes. For maybe five seconds, I stared rather uncomfortably into this horrible red light, and it burned. I wanted to close my eyes desperately, as it felt not dissimilar to staring into the sun. But they wouldn't move. I tried to yell, but I couldn't say anything. And, much like staring into the sun, you see little else. After the five or so seconds, the light turned off, and I could just make out the disc object flying off down the road toward the ocean. I was awake for maybe ten more seconds before I fell asleep. For full context, this all happened in about 20 seconds, give or take. I need to point out that this happened in 2003, in rural Newfoundland. At that time, there were no such things as drones. Drones were the terrifying flying machines that the US was sending to bomb the shit out of Iraq. They were something I'd only even seen recently on the TV, as those big, white, plain-looking things. I have no real explanation for this other than possibly aliens. I had tried to talk to my family and classmates about it, but they mostly called me a loony and laughed. Eventually, that night passed from me trying to tell people about it to thinking nobody will ever believe me, so why bother? A month, maybe two passes, and my life carries on as usual. The only real difference is I become shit at math. I was a top student in my class, always pulling best grades for most of my school life until that point, given the math isn't all that hard. But I really started to suck. My grades went from 90s to 60s, often 50s, and sometimes even failing in the math department. Often, I was failing in the math that I was able to do not even four months prior. Nobody was concerned for some reason, but that was a frequent theme in my teen years. So, I was now just the kid that had fallen from grace. Still had amazing grades in everything else, just never again in math. So, one night I remember being woken up. Again, my body felt like it was asleep, and again I had some control over my neck. But I remember this like I remember a dream. But way too many details for it to be normal, but I'll get to that. 
The first thing that hits me is the blinding white light. It was coming from outside my window, brighter than stadium lights, and coming from who knows where. But I knew it was close to my house. All I heard was a low, growling hum coming from outside. In my room were two of those discs I had seen before, shining a wide red light all over the room, which dampened the sheer brightness of the light outside enough that I could see. Then I see one of them. It walks into my room, and I remember being scared-ish, but largely indifferent. It was easily over 12 feet tall, and was uncomfortably skinny. Its arms and legs were way too long for the tiny torso that it had, about the size of a child. They were multi-jointed in at least seven places that allowed it to fold its arms and legs enough that it could fit into my room. I have no doubt that if it were to fully extend all of its joints, the thing could easily top 20 feet. It had hands which had too many joints on the fingers, way too many fingers, and no thumbs. They were in a half circle around its pretty round palm, and generally unsettling now that I think about it. It had a head, a huge head, but it lacked any real eyes except for maybe tiny pinpoints where a massive socket would otherwise be. It had no nose, no hair, no real chin, and two holes where our cheeks would be. I'm guessing that it might be a mouth, but hell if I know. The head was thin, because of course it was thin, and resembled somewhat of an oblong pancake. The whole thing had white skin with a gray undertone, or what I assumed to be such given the lighting in the room. The creature held out its hand, and instinctively I held it. It walked me out of the room, stark naked, and was leading me to my living room. When I get into my hallway, I see all the doors in my house are open, and there are a dozen of these things just sort of mulling about. I remember one looking into our linen closet, one walking into our basement, and another unscrewing a light bulb. All over the house were the discs that gave everything that faint red tint and the huge stadium lights from outside, making it look like broad daylight, but with a slight red tint. In the dining room was my mother, also stark naked, kind of just standing there, as two of these creatures were in my kitchen doing something. Lying on the couch in the living room was my dad, again naked, with three of the creatures looming over him, with a bunch of weird tools in their hands. I can assume doing some kind of procedure. I remember asking... Where is my sister? To which I got the reply, Outside, from the creature holding my hand. I'm still unsure if this was telepathic or if the creature said something out of its uncomfortable holes, but I accepted that as good enough of an answer. As I walked by my dad, I could see that the creatures were fiddling with him, poking and prodding him. I remember being concerned, as I know that my dad had just had a surgery, but I again got the feeling that it would be fine. The creature I was with placed me in the corner of the room, facing the wall, and I sat down cross-legged without much issue. The creature then left, and I was there for about a minute or so. All I can remember from that time is a few details. Above me was one of the discs, shining its broad red light. But I had the faint blue as well, giving my vision an odd hue. The only other distinguishing feature I remember is the silence. The piercing and utter silence, only broken by that soft, low, growling hum coming from outside. I remember then waking up, back in my bed, no worse for wear. All I think is, damn, that was a realistic dream, and went about my day. The only difference is I had, and still have, a small lump on the back of my neck the size of a split pea. It comes and goes. Sometimes I feel it, and sometimes I don't. And a few times I've squeezed it, and some dry, powdery substance came out. I just assumed it was some weird medical thing, but if it ever happens again, I might try to get it looked at. A few years go by, and my dad and I were chatting. We got on the topic of aliens, one of his personal favorites. I tell my dad about the multi-jointed creature thing, and before I can even get to the point in my story where I reach the living room, he goes, man, I had a dream like that. 
bunch of skinny white men with hoods were poking me. Right after that surgery, there was a red hue all over everything. I remember seeing them sit you in a corner and you just sort of stayed there for a bit. Crazy dreams, huh? I asked if it seemed real to him, and he said, Well, yeah. I've had those dreams ever since I was a kid. The white guys in hoods never do anything interesting. This was the only time. Our brains are weird, aren't they? I've brought it up a few times since, but I don't get a whole lot more than what I've already told you. My sister has somewhat of a similar story, but she remembers like three seconds of it. I have maybe two minutes. The best guess I have is aliens, and this is far from the only time that I've encountered these creatures, but I'll save that story for another day. And this happened about four years ago in South Africa. To start, I must mention that I am a serious skeptic when it comes to ghosts or the paranormal. I almost always resort to a practical answer, but in this case, I could find no excuse for what happened. We moved into a new house. The previous tenants were apparently drug addicts and you could see that some really bad shit happened there. One of the doors had a hole in the middle, with a piece of hair sticking to it, like someone's head had been bashed through. Anyway, one afternoon I was home alone watching TV. There was no wind outside. The fan and the air conditioning were off. My hair flicked forward, and then flicked me in the face hard. I looked for my cats, assuming that they were playing with my hair. But they were both outside. Like I said, there was no fan, nothing at all that could have caused that. Two nights later, my husband and I were watching TV, and we heard what sounded like a shower come on. We both went to have a look, and it turned out it was coming from outside. The front garden was pretty much flooded, with absolutely no water source. No rain, no tap, no water hole, house pipe, gutter, nothing and only in one patch. A few weeks later again, we were watching TV at night. We heard three loud bangs on a window from the back of the house. Being South Africa, we thought, oh shit, an intruder. My husband ran to have a look, and there was no one there. There's no access to the back except for a padlock gate. The walls are very high with electric fencing on top, and my husband was there within a few seconds. There's absolutely no way that someone could have knocked and gotten away over the walls or the gate that quickly. I should also mention that while living in this house, my husband and I fought constantly. We never used to fight before, and we haven't since. Again, a few weeks later, our doorbell rang. We lived in a complex, so I thought maybe some kids were messing around because there was no one there. It rang again, and again, no one there. I went outside, and the complex is in a circle shape, so you can see pretty far down both sides of the road, and there was nobody. The same night, a little later, it went off yet again, and the tune of the bell had changed from a normal ding-dong sound to that of an actual melody of some kind. It was one of the preset songs on the bell, sure, but not the one that we had chosen. I thought, okay. Don't panic, it must have a short or something. But it never happened again. We got hold of a lady from our church and had a meeting with her, not at the house. She said without a doubt, she could sense that something was going on at home, without me even really getting into it. We then had a priest bless the house, and ever since that day, we didn't experience anything else. Not one thing. Like I said before, I always look for obvious answers, always, but I couldn't explain why these things happened. I promise you, this is 100% true.
I have had a number of experiences in a house in Cape Town, South Africa, in a certain section in Belleville, to be more precise. I'm trying to find some sort of online archive where I could research the experiences that I had. If anybody knows anything about this or could help, that would be great. Alternatively, if you work somewhere and I could give you some information, let me know if anything comes of it. I would appreciate that too. As for a bit of backstory, I've had many unexplained happenings in a certain house in Belleville. I think I experienced pretty much all of my paranormal experiences there. Extremely uncomfortable feelings in certain parts of the house. Noises of children playing. Sightings of a girl, probably around 9 or 10, being hit by items that were thrown at me. Doors and toilet seats slam all the time. And younger children have nightmares while living there. They'll wake up in the middle of the night and have dreams of blood coming out of the walls and the flowers. I'm not too sure, but I do believe that I heard that another couple who lived in this house before us moved out after less than a year, with no reason given. If anybody can help me find something out about what's going on, I would appreciate it. Recently, my friend died suddenly. His last text to me was, Sorry, but we've got no word from toxicology yet. All we know is that he didn't drink enough to kill him, he wasn't sick, and there were no signs of a struggle. I didn't find out on the day that it happened. I have no clue what I did that day. I know it was a full moon. I remember coming home and looking for it. I have no texts or posts or screenshots from that day. I have a total gap in time. My friend and I had a rare spiritual connection and talked often of quantum cosmology. We could always tell when the other one was feeling off. I had always joked with him that if he died before me, I would want him to come to my apartment, flicker my lights, and give me some kind of a sign that he was still there. Four nights ago, I'm finally passing out after having been awake the majority of the time since this happened. I'm going mental at this point, looking through all of his posts, and realizing that a lot of the content had common themes. Swallowing someone else's demons, being swallowed by your own demons, being stuck in a labyrinth, a tired soul seeking escape from the maze. My grandma calls before bed to tell me that she's saying a prayer that I'll get a sign because everybody knows I'm a disaster. Soon after, my lights start going mental. I have the dimmer light and all three were flickering out of sync. I freaked out for a while, but at this point I'm beat, so finally I just pass out. I dream that Jordan, my friend, is telling me to go walk downtown to the highest hill I can find and calm down. Not just a dream. He's in my room, I swear it, in a gray sweater I've never seen before, and he's sitting down laughing at me, telling me that the answer I'm looking for is so obvious, and to just go take my walk and I'll figure it all out. It was like a sleep paralysis, but I was totally calm when I saw him. I get up and I walk calmly downtown. I know there's a spot here that people go to to pray and follow some sacred walk, but the last time I went it was all unfinished. I text my friend and I say that for some reason I need to go there. I head up the hill figuring I'll find some meaningful passage or stone or something. And I find a giant labyrinth. There's this huge labyrinth at the top. For those that don't know, the labyrinth walk symbolizes your quest as a spirit on a human journey rather than a human on a spiritual journey. Oddly, that was one of the last quotes he had sent me. He was also obsessed with the book Looking for Alaska, which I didn't bother reading until this happened. But holy hell. It's about a guy who gives up on searching for answers when a friend dies suddenly to escape the labyrinth and realizes that forgiving his friend for dying is the only way out of the labyrinth of suffering. Side note, 
When I told his girlfriend about what I had seen and experienced, she said that he died wearing the gray hoodie I described. Before I begin, let me give you some background. I was about 13 at the time, not under the influence of any narcotics or medications, nor have I taken any mind-altering substances since then. I had just come back from a class trip to Washington, D.C. It was late, maybe around 7 or 8 at night. My father picked me up at the airport, and we began driving home on the highway. And that's when I saw it. It was an unknown distance away, and looked close and far at the same time. It was a gray steel color and had, well, it was honestly very stereotypical for the most part. It was in the shape of like ravioli. It was a round, perfectly circular ravioli shape with a bulge on both sides of the middle and a ring of lights around it. The lights were all large and gave off a light that was very hard to describe. They were blue, yellow, and white all at the same time, and yet they didn't give off any kind of flare or beam, and when the craft moved, they didn't give a typical trail that you would get when looking at a light moving out of a car window. Now, the craft moved so perfectly, it looked as if it wasn't moving at all. It matched the exact speed of our car, which, if you've ever driven down I-95, is really quite an impressive task. I tried to get my father's attention because I needed some confirmation that I was indeed seeing what I was seeing. In those days, things were a bit strained between us due to some issues at home. So he grumpily brushed me off and kept driving. It felt like this went on for a while, but after the event, I realized it couldn't have been more than a few minutes due to the time on the dashboard clock. Things got very odd very quickly. The craft, while keeping perfectly matched with our car, started moving on its side, where it was nearly impossible to see except for the bulges. It then did something that I will truly never forget. It split in half, but in a way that was so mechanically perfect, I knew right then it wasn't man-made. The way it split was as it was moving, and there was no jittering or stalling or any evidence of anything mechanical that could have allowed it to separate, let alone be held together in the first place. After it split for a few moments, it kept pace with the car. Then each half, while still on its side, shot across the sky at blinding speeds in separate directions. And that's the story. Make of it what you will, but I swear by this sighting. It was an amazing experience that showed me we truly understand nothing about our universe. This happened about a year ago in Tucson, Arizona. It was my first time visiting Arizona and I had no idea how many allegedly haunted places were in the small downtown area of Tucson. It was really exciting for me, as someone who was basically born obsessed with the paranormal and with mysteries in general. I was there with two other females, a friend that I traveled there with and an acquaintance who lived there and was hosting us. It was our first night there, and the woman we were staying with took us out to see the city and have a few drinks. We visited a couple supposedly haunted bars and did a quick round of karaoke before we started walking home. By this time, our host was clearly pretty drunk, but my friend and I were very chill and clear-headed. The house we were staying at was located on the same street, and just a couple of blocks away from the oldest bar in Tucson. It was about 1.30 in the morning. We were talking and laughing, just enjoying the night. The streets weren't empty, but there also weren't many people out. When we turned the corner onto her street, the bar was about two blocks ahead of us, 
and was brightly lit, but the area we were currently in was fairly dark. I was kind of looking down when my friend said, Um, you guys? Don't freak out, but there's a guy in a cape walking toward us right now. I looked up and my stomach flipped. There was a man in a thick black hooded cloak heading in our direction. I instantly felt uncomfortable because he was moving with a slow, steady, heavy gait, and he was walking down the very middle of the street, which seemed really odd. As soon as we noticed him, he began moving from the center of the road and veering off toward his left, as if he was intending to come up onto the sidewalk and face us. My heart instantly began racing and I pulled my friend closer to me. We kept walking but slowed down just a little, anticipating his move onto the sidewalk. There were cars lined up along the sidewalk, parked at a diagonal, and the man stepped between two cars in order to reach the sidewalk, but he didn't emerge. As we came closer to where he should have been, I was afraid he was going to jump out from between the cars, but he wasn't there at all. He wasn't in any of the cars either. This would have been enough to totally freak me out, but at that moment I looked up and there he was, now nearly 20 feet ahead of us, walking down the very middle of the street again, but this time walking away from us and toward the bar. At this point, I knew something very weird was going on, and I became absolutely fixated on him, like I wanted to study every little nuance of his movement, just trying to process what was even going on. I could see his black boots sticking out from the bottom hem of the cloak, it went all the way down to his ankles. I watched how the fabric swayed heavily with his lumbered steps. He looked huge and powerful. He looked just as solid and as real as me or my friends or anyone else. As he drew closer to the bar, he began again veering off toward the sidewalk and the entrance to the bar. The bar was on the same side of the street as us, and we were about one block away by this time. He stepped up onto the sidewalk and headed directly for the entrance. At this point, two women walked out of the bar and walked right past him. I mean, should have brushed up against him or ran into him, but never even acknowledged his presence. They then stood outside just a foot or two away from him, talking and flipping their hair, never even glancing back once. They definitely did not see him. At this same instant, I noticed that he had stopped at the entrance to the bar. There's a really big, super bright sign just about the entrance that glows the name of the bar, so he was perfectly illuminated now. With him standing there, I had a clear perspective of his height. He was taller than the top of the door. The tip of his hood was only a few inches below the bottom of the lit up sign. He had his head slightly down, and I noticed that his feet seemed to be stuck mid-step. It was the strangest thing. It was almost like looking at a computer glitch. One foot was in front of the other, slightly raised up with the heel touching the ground, but he was just rocking back and forth like he was stuck in the motion of taking the step. Then our drunk friend, who had noticed none of this, said something, and I glanced in her direction. When I looked back at him a millisecond later, he was gone. We even went into the bar and he was nowhere there, and there's nowhere he could have gone. They had CCTV cameras with the videos being displayed right there above the bar, but I was too shy to ask if they could check for footage. This experience has absolutely haunted me ever since. His presence didn't necessarily feel scary, although I was afraid right at first when I thought he was some creepy dude wandering the streets in a cape, but when I realized he wasn't human, I felt calm and almost comforted by his energy. I couldn't stop talking about it afterward and wondering what it was we saw. We passed by that bar several more times over the rest of our stay, and each time there was a person just standing there leaning up against a pole outside the bar, who either followed us for a block or tried to talk to us, and it just seemed odd. My friend strangely began kind of seeming to detach herself from me as the days progressed. We were roommates at the time, and when we got home from the trip, she dropped me off at our apartment and went straight to her boyfriend's house. I didn't see or hear from her for almost a week. It really felt like she was trying to avoid me. 
I started spiraling into a deep depression. Within four months, our friendship had completely deteriorated in the worst way. We ended up moving out of the apartment that summer, and were no longer friends at all. Although there are clear circumstances that led to this and I take responsibility for my role in the friendship breakup, I always wonder if that encounter in Arizona influenced any of it to happen, because when I look back it really seemed like there was some kind of turning point in the way she felt toward me after that. Just to be clear, ever since we stopped being friends, my life has been richer and more joyous and more fulfilling than ever. All these things in my life practically rearranged themselves when she and I began fighting, and now I'm genuinely happier, and I feel more loved and supported than I ever have. Whether or not that cloaked entity had anything to do with it, I'm very grateful to have had that experience. It's the most potent, paranormal, and mysterious experience I've had to date. I'm wondering if anyone else has ever seen anything like this before, or had their lives dramatically changed after encountering the other side. This is a story about ghost hunting, although I'm not sure I'm so much of a hunter as I am a magnet. A few years back, my quasi-sometimes boyfriend and I were asked to go ghost hunting by a group of his friends in a really old cemetery here in Alabama. With that being said, I live near one and I frequent it often, so I'm used to the things that happen. I just roll with it, unless it gets bad. There were seven of us on a new moon who rode out to the cemetery. We all got out, and everybody but me had a flashlight. I generally find I don't need one for such adventures. I just tend to go where my feet lead me. So five of the seven of them were being terribly disrespectful, yelling, screaming, cursing the powers that be, trying to get a showing. Well, you just do not do that. You would be unappreciative of somebody yelling in your home. Plus, it puts out so much negative energy, one can certainly see why the things that appear might do so. The boyfriend had extinguished his flashlight at my request, because I can't see properly if one is near me. It blinds me. He goes to my left, and I quickly go up a bit and to the right. His friends were deeper in than we were but they were still hooping and hollering like fools. I stopped very suddenly, took one step forward, and then a voice whispered, Mama, I'm scared. The boyfriend looks over at me and I said, You heard it, right? He nods. I said, I'm standing next to a two-year-old baby girl's marker. He told me, of course, that there was no way. I had no light, I was barefoot, etc. About that time his friends got quiet, because the wind had really come up. The boyfriend says, She has something over here, y'all may want to confirm it with your lights. His was still off. I told the little one that it was okay, and she needed to stay here with her mama, as she couldn't go home with me. His friends were hearing me talk, and I think they thought I was full of crap until one of them turned on their light. Sure enough, I was standing at her headstone. Her mother was in the ground next to her. I've never seen five people move so fast to get out of a place. We had a good chuckle out of that, because he had seen my power ability before and knew it to be true. He even tried to warn them that I wasn't a joke. They never asked us to go hunting with them again. Can't imagine why. This happened about three years ago, but it has really affected how I think about ghosts and the paranormal. When I tell friends, some of them find it very creepy, while others say that they don't believe in anything supernatural, and while it's odd, they feel there must be a natural explanation. 
I took a family vacation, me, my parents, and two siblings, over Christmas. All of us were already adults at this time, and while my family is agnostic and holds out judgment for the afterlife, none of us are religious or believe that there is a true afterlife with heaven or hell. That said, my parents thought it would be fun for us to stay at a haunted hotel in Jerome, Arizona, on our way to a resort town farther down the road. This whole town is supposedly haunted, but especially the hotel, which used to be a mental hospital that has long since been converted. We checked in, and were given one of the most supposedly haunted sweeps, because we needed two large adjoining rooms for everyone to fit. So far, everything's normal. Until we get to the room. My mom and sisters suddenly smell something that they described as putrid in a spot in one of our rooms. I couldn't smell it, so I dismissed it and moved on. We took a walk around town, and I asked a bakery owner about the haunted stories, and she said it's just accepted that sometimes things fly off her shelves at home, but nothing hostile. Here's where the weird stuff starts. We signed up for the nighttime tour of the hotel, in a largish group of people, and we were all given electromagnetic readers while we walk around and hear the stories of mental patients that had died there. Halfway through the tour, my dad and sister hear a sound and turn around to see the doorknob of a room next to them shaking and rattling incessantly. I didn't personally see it, so by this time I was getting bored. I always thought it would be cool if ghosts existed, but I don't really believe they can do anything to affect the physical world. I asked my other sister to take some Instagram pictures of me in a cool-looking couch in one of the supposedly haunted suites, and she took some quick shots. I passed my hand over the table in front of me to pose, when I felt an extremely cold chilling sensation in my hand and wrist, and I told her to stop. When I looked at the photos, I was shocked. I have a series of three photos where you can see that I'm switching around with a startled look on my face, shaking my hand and there's a white cloud streaking around my hand and wrist in the photos that appears and disappears throughout the three pictures. Needless to say, I was scared. I was no longer willing to sleep on my own, so I took the bed with my mom. Yes, I know. My dad and sisters slept a bit and went to walk around in the middle of the night in the boiler room where they said they felt some weird stuff. I don't remember exactly what happened, but one of them felt a sudden strong chill on their back. Meanwhile, I was sleeping and my mom suddenly woke up and slammed her hand on the dresser. She said sorry and then went back to sleep. She's never been a sleepwalker or ever moved in her sleep, but whatever. I slept pretty deeply that night, but I kept being woken up by a super loud clanking and rattling in the halls that sounded like gurneys being wheeled back and forth. This is not a busy hotel, in the middle of the desert. In the morning, my family said that they heard it too, but when my dad and sisters walked around, they saw nothing. In the morning, my mom said she had a dream that there was a little boy and a young nurse talking to him. Then the nurse aged and became mean and scowling and raised her hand to hit the boy. She said she then heard a voice telling her to hit him herself. This is why she hit the dresser. Keep in mind that this was a mental hospital, and one of the ghosts there is supposed to be a little boy, but no one knows why or how he died. Does anyone else have experiences like this? For me, the photos are really what made me believe that something was going on that was beyond the natural. Obviously, for privacy reasons, I don't want to share those photos, but they do exist. The fact that my family can confirm some of the things that happened also makes me not want to dismiss it so easily. But at the same time, I don't know how to explain any of this. I live in a tiny town in northern BC. We are surrounded by a lot of untouched forests and beautiful rivers. My family lives out in the country and we're about 10 minutes away from an uninhabited valley. 
It had an old road going through it from ages ago, and it had an old pioneer homestead that we could make our way down to. I think some loser kids burnt it down around 2000 or 2001, though. Even from a young age, I hated going to this place with my family. I had no reason to despise it so much. Everyone that visited was always in awe of how beautiful it was down there. But I always just got this sick feeling in my stomach. My sighting was from when I was very young, so I realize not many will believe it, but it stuck with me. My family was showing a cousin from Australia this place. Our town is boring, so outdoor stuff is really all we have to offer, and I was sitting on my dad's shoulders while the adults walked around. Now the road we were on had large shrubs on either side. In BC, we have a berry called Saskatoons, and the bushes on this stretch were tall and thick. Because I was on my dad's shoulders, I could see over these, but nobody else could. I remember looking over, and on the other side of these bushes was this big field with a dense forest on the other side. I saw something massive and stark white walking on two legs into those trees. As a dumb kid, I yelled out, Polar bear! which my parents obviously ignored because there are absolutely no polar bears here. And that was that. I still have no idea what I saw, but I'm sure there could be a rational explanation involving an albino animal, possibly an overactive kid's imagination. My neighbor, who is also the closest thing that I've had to a grandfather, lives in a spot that overlooks a large field with a valley below. You pass his home to get onto the property that I had my sighting on. A few years ago, he told us of a night that he watched what he thought was a helicopter coming in to land in the large field below his home. Right as he looked at it, it was landing, and then it shot straight up and disappeared into the sky. He's a pretty serious guy, and he said this in front of my parents, so I doubt he would lie. He's convinced that he witnessed a UFO. At that point, I thought, all right, maybe there was something to what I saw. And then, my younger sister had a sighting. She was driving home on our country road after a late shift. She remembered seeing two dark silhouettes of people, no reflective clothing or anything, walking in the pitch black and thinking, wow, what idiots. Just then, one of these things turns and glances at her. She told me that it had green eye shine, which she knew that humans shouldn't have, yet it was human shaped. She glanced quickly down at her clock and then back up, and whatever she had seen had completely disappeared in front of her. I'm still not sure what I saw that day, but given that my neighbor and my sister have seen things that are strange in the same general area, I'm thinking maybe I wasn't such an imaginative kid after all. This happened in 2005 to 2006. I was 16 to 17 and living at home in my parents' basement. I had just started dating a girl a little younger than me that claimed she had the ability to communicate with spirits. I was pretty skeptical of her abilities, but being a teenage boy, I didn't really think too much of it as I was attracted to her and that was all that mattered. I had just gotten home from a soccer game I had early that morning, and I walked downstairs and everything was pulled up from under our staircase in our laundry room. I asked my dad why everything was out, and he told me that instead of using the litter box, the cats had been going under the stairs, so he had to get under there and clean it all up. I helped him a little bit and then went to my room to shower as my girlfriend was coming over. So I hop in the shower, and about 10 minutes into the shower, I start hearing a very loud, aggressive banging on the door. It made me jump, but of course, I just thought my dad needed something from me. So I shouted, One second, Dad. I'm just in the shower. Not even two seconds go by, and I hear more frantic banging. I'm a little annoyed at this point, and I just go, Dude, I'm in the shower. One second. 
A couple more seconds go by, and more banging persists. Finally, I'm getting pretty mad, so I reach out of my shower to grab a towel, storm over to the door, and angrily open it. I shout down, Okay, what do you want? I'm taking a shower. And of course, nobody was there. I'm a little weirded out at this point. I had chills run down my spine. The basement always creeped me out. So I poke my head out and look to the other side of the basement, thinking maybe he was storming off or something, and there it is. A black figure standing there, as if I had caught him off guard. No eyes, no mouth. Just a figure, standing there looking at me. We stared at each other for a second or two, and then he moved across the hallway toward the laundry room. I slammed the door shut and started hyperventilating. What was I going to do? I had to pass the laundry room to get upstairs. I quickly got dressed and gingerly opened my door and looked to the other side of the basement. Nothing. No sign of the figure. I tiptoed up toward the other side of the basement until I could see the stairs, and I ran up them. The first thing I did was call out for my dad. My mom heard me and answered, He's in the garage. I ran out to the garage and said kind of awkwardly, Hey, Dad? Were you banging on my bedroom door like five minutes ago? My dad turned and looked at me kind of confused and said, No? Why? I didn't know what to say. I think I was in shock. I realized that whatever that thing was physically hit my door. If it could do that, what else was it capable of? So I'm sitting there in the garage with this blank look on my face, and I hear the dog start barking inside. At this point, I realized that my girlfriend must have pulled in the front of the house. So I run to the house and meet her at the front door and try to play it off like everything is normal. She walks in and has a worried look on her face. She goes, what did you do? I was like, what do you mean? She goes, you've changed something about the house. Whatever you've changed, you need to change it back. Now. I explained to her that the cats made a mess under the stairs, so my dad had to pull everything out to clean it. She told me to put everything back the way it was, and we did. For the five or six more years that I lived in that basement, I never had a problem. I didn't see anything. But every time I walked past that laundry room, I got goosebumps. So, I grew up in a house that had a few spirits in it. My family are all skeptics and would find some way to explain things away. A few experiences and then I'll get to the main story. First, our house was three stories with technically three master bedrooms, one on each floor. The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear somebody walking around in the office at night sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally I'd hear talking. My parents would always say that someone was awake and making those noises, and that the toilet and water running was just faulty pipes. Maybe on the pipes, but no one was ever awake during the other things. Second, there would be a shadow figure that would pace on the top floor. There was like a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I presumed was a lady in a dress, pacing. My parents just said it was the shadow of somebody outside. We were on a hill, overlooking all of our neighbors. I don't know how they thought this was possible. Third, I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from the bathroom. When no one was home and I was in there, someone would bang on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music. I heard the banging really loudly, so loudly that it shook the room. Then the locked door swung open and I heard a scream. My parents said it was just my brother pranking me, which is something that he never did. Anyway, 
On to the main event. My brother's about 10 years older than me. He was the only sibling living at home with my parents and I. He had the master bedroom in the basement. I was never really in the basement except for going to the garage because it was in the basement next to the bedroom. I always remember feeling uneasy down there, but I wanted a big room. So when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room and eventually they caved and let me have it. I moved all of my stuff downstairs, painted it and everything. I loved my new room. I was talking to my brother about it one day and he casually says, watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked as obviously he was kidding, right? My whole family besides me never talked about stuff like that. I just laughed and shrugged it off. I figured he was probably trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over and we were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom, laughing and stuff like that. She had to go to the bathroom, so she closes the door and I was just kind of zoning out. All of a sudden she goes, that's not funny. I asked her what she meant as I hadn't done anything. She said that she heard somebody laughing right outside the door, but I didn't do anything or hear anything. She left freaked out and I assumed that my brother put her up to it since she liked my brother. A few days later, I hear someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking it's my mom, but I don't hear anything. I get out and as I'm putting my robe on, I hear a little girl giggle and then, are you looking for me? I freak out. I throw open the door to my room, but nobody's there. I check the garage and ended up setting off the house alarm. So nobody could have come or gone through there without everyone knowing. I run upstairs and my mom is pissed that I set off the alarm and I told her what just happened. She then told me that my brother had a similar story when we first moved in, but that it was nothing. I called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said that I was the little girl. He said he was kidding because, quote, you would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. I never did anything like that. I told him that, and that's when he got legitimately creeped out. I still would occasionally hear the little girl. I never saw her, but she did like to laugh and open the bathroom and closet doors. I named her Sarah. My brother called me up today to ask me about this. He asked me if I was sure that I never tried to scare him by laughing, and I told him no. He got uncomfortable. I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house was mildly haunted. My friends and I are on our way from Chicago back to our home in Evansville, Indiana. As such, we have to drive through the Midwestern country to get there. Pitch black highways surrounded by trees and cornfields. About four hours away from home, my friend screams and I look up. We hit a deer going 50. The poor guy bounced off the front end and was probably dead on impact. We come to a stop and commiserate, call our parents, etc. We're stranded on a quiet highway in the middle of nowhere, trees to our right and a few houses a bit far off to our left, all surrounded by cornfields, of course. My friend is standing outside surveying the damage when we hear a scream, a man's scream, a bit far off to our left. My other friend and I look at each other, wide-eyed, a few minutes pass and we hear one again. I make a joke about skinwalkers and my friend gets back in the car. A bit later, after calling 911, we heard another scream, a woman this time, and it seemed closer. 
were waiting on the deputy and nervously joking about whether it's skinwalkers or just crazy woodland people. And my friend facing the trees suddenly laughs nervously and rolls up the window. She goes, I just heard clicking noises outside my window and I'm rolling it up because I'm not going to pretend like I just didn't hear that. I know that clicking noises are often a thing with skinwalker stories and things like that. We're not really sure what happened. We think maybe something was trying to lure us out into the woods, but we didn't go, obviously. Obviously we survived too, but I don't think any of us are going to forget that experience anytime soon. This creepy encounter occurred in the fall of 2001. My family lived in a nice house in the middle of some dense woods. A few of my friends consistently brought their four-wheelers with them when they came to spend the night. We had a huge yellow four-wheeler and rode pretty much constantly that year. The woods behind my parents' house had trails, every which way, that snaked around and down the haulers and to the roads. My friends and I, 11 to 12 years old at the time, had these big plans to get street signs and put them on the trees so that all of our trails would have their names proudly displayed. One day, a friend came to stay and we rode around on the trails for hours. When we became bored of the trails, we took off on the main road to a fire training center about three miles away. The fire training center was down a one-lane gravel road with trees butting up to the side so close that a car would get scratched going down it. At the end of the road was a pole gate to keep people like us out. On the way there, we passed by a small pickup truck with two men in it. When we got to the little trail that went down and around the gate, we saw a dead dog wrapped up in a blanket, blocking the path. We decided to turn around because I didn't want to run over the thing. So we started heading back on the main road, and again, about halfway back, we passed the small pickup truck with the men. My friend and I joke that the men are following us because they know we saw the dog that they dropped off and that they hadn't buried it the way they should have. We get almost back to my house and decide we can probably find another trail around the dog, maybe on the other side of the gate. So off we go. We turn on to the little gravel road and go to the end. There is no other trail, no other way around, but the dog is kind of laying on half of the blanket. So we sit there for a few minutes while I try to convince my friend if she just tugs on the edge of the blanket, we could move the blanket and the dog out of the way without actually touching or disturbing it. She's not budging, but I really want to ride on the other side of the gate. After a few minutes, it's clear that she is not touching the blanket so we turn around to head back home. We start back down the gravel road and after a second, we turn to the straight part. Panic set in quickly. The small pickup is sitting in the road, blocking our only exit. The trees touch both sides of the truck, so there's no going around it. Two large men sit staring at us. After what feels like forever, I whip the four-wheeler around and go through the trail anyway. We get around the gate into safety. Were they watching me try to persuade her to move the blanket? Could they see us the whole time? Were they still moving until we got to the clear part? What would have happened if I hadn't given up on the blanket? Those questions scare me now as much as they did back then. That gravel road only goes to the fire training center, which is blocked off by a large metal gate. A car that pulls down there is only able to back the entire way out onto the main road. Anyway, we soon forgot about it and it really didn't change much. I like to think that our town is really safe and that the men were just curious about what the heck we were doing going back and forth. But when I read some stories, I think about what it could have been, how it could have gone differently, and it really freaks me out.
There's a town in Alabama called Helena. The amount of paranormal activity that goes on in this town is frightening. I used to live there, and my house, specifically, was the house that many of the townspeople knew about or had heard about. The history of the town is what makes it so beyond haunted. There were two F5 tornadoes that tore into the entire area and leveled all the buildings, plus several trains that derailed and spilled several tons of deadly chemicals. Not to mention the fact that the whole town is built on three ancient burial grounds and four desecrated graveyards. My house was built on what was the rusting place of a chief of some kind, and my house was insanely active. When I lived in that house, I was pushed down the stairs. I had chairs moved in front of me while I was walking, knives thrown at me. I was watched while I slept. I heard my name called, screamed, whispered, even written in the steam on the mirror in the bathroom. Yet all of that failed to scare me as much as three different instances did. Number one, the third year I was there, it was Christmas Day. My mother and I were sitting on the couch watching a movie. I had just gotten the movie as a present. We both heard the sound of metal being dragged. Immediately, both of us looked toward the dining room as we had tile floors and iron dining chairs. We could easily see the entire dining room from the couch. And after what felt like an hour of waiting, but was probably only moments, we watched a dining room chair move a good five feet as though it had been shoved with extreme aggression. Number two, I had just gotten home from school and all I wanted to do was grab a snack and relax a bit in front of the television. So I grabbed my snack, closed the cabinet and went to sit down. A few seconds later, I started to smell rotten meat. I turned off the television and just then, I heard a loud explosion from the kitchen and the sound of things falling on the floor. I jumped up and ran in there. Literally every door, cabinet, and drawer were wide open, and all of the knives from the silverware drawer were sticking into the ceiling. Three. The last one is the one that scared me the most. It was about three in the morning, when something, or someone, woke me up. I remember seeing this puff of smoke beside my bedroom door that kept getting bigger and bigger. I remember staring at this smoke puff and just sitting in awe. Suddenly it started to change and an arm began to reach out of it. At that point, I just wanted to get out of there, but this thing was blocking the door. So I just watched as another arm reached out, followed by a head, a neck, and a torso. I couldn't see any identifying features, except the eyes. They were just large balls of glowing red, and I knew that they were fixed on me. Even now, I keep reliving those days. It always felt like I was supposed to understand something, like there was some message I was supposed to be figuring out but I just never could. I have a few creepy backwoods stories, and this one may be a little out there. It's more than just creepy woods, and I can't explain it. It could have been some sort of mass hysteria or a group hallucination that lasted multiple days, maybe even shared sleep paralysis, but I doubt it. The story starts like this. About 10 years ago, I'm a cocky little brat, 18 year old dude who thinks he has the world by the balls. The world had me by the balls, I later discovered, and I was with my very serious girlfriend of two years and counting. First time I ever dated a girl, and I really felt like I was in love and could see myself marrying this girl. Thank God that didn't happen, but that's another story. 
So my parents are really strict conservative Christians. They'd never let me and my girlfriend Caitlin share a room at night. Caitlin's parents couldn't have given less of a crap. They let us drink and we had our own bedroom upstairs. Looking back, her mom was kinda not the best mother, but she was nice enough. One weekend in summer, Caitlin and her parents asked if I'd like to come up three hours north to her grandparents' town for their anniversary. This place is hours away from civilization, as secluded as it gets. See Amish people the whole way up, northern Michigan. I said, hell yeah. Her grandparents are wealthy and fun, and I knew it'd be a good time. But too many people stayed in their big, lovely house, so we had to rent a cabin. In the woods. This cabin is at least 20 minutes from the village or town or whatever. Right away, it seemed off is back in the woods off this creepy, secluded, quiet dirt road. Everything silent. The houses next to us were dead silent and empty. It was just us. I'm not worried about it at all because I have this wonderful and fleeting confidence that alcohol and the possibility of getting some action this weekend will give a young man. PBR and hormones, baby. So I'll skip the daytime activities as they don't matter here. We just had a regular fun time with family and we returned to our cabin for the night. Our room was upstairs in this sort of loft area. The cabin was oldish and rustic and just empty. Not physically empty, just void of something. The kind of emptiness you can feel. But hey, we're way out in the woods and no one has probably been here in ages. Of course it feels dead in here. That night was when it happened, and I'm positive that I'll miss a bunch of details as I blocked it out of my memory until I saw this subreddit and it all came back. I'm sleeping in this god-awful mattress next to Caitlin, and I drift off and have the most horrible nightmares. They weren't dreams, though. It was exactly real. It was as though my soul was able to move around and interact with the bedroom our bodies were lying fast in asleep but I was awake. My body was asleep, but I was somehow completely mobile without a body. The bedroom was dark and the moonlight from the window lit up the center of the room. And there were so many people there, all deceased, standing in a circle chanting. In the center of their circle, I see a little girl with blonde hair, maybe seven years old, and she's in this white dress, almost glowing in the most disturbing way. The people turn to me as they notice that I'm watching and aware. They slowly approach me, all chanting and murmuring. I can't remember the words exactly, but I'm positive they were performing a ritual and sacrificing or murdering this little girl. It was kind of like the scene from Rosemary's Baby, something that I never saw until very recently, by the way. They came at me with their hands outstretched, looking dead and rotten. And as they begin to strangle me, I wake up. And waking up is usually when everything goes back to normal. But I wake up and I see the rocking chair is rocking, like flying, as if somebody slammed it. At this point, I'm like, nope, F this. I close my eyes and just pray and hope that the sun will rise. It didn't. I fell back asleep. The next dream goes like this. I'm on a roller coaster with all sorts of people, and it's going straight up to the sky, like into heaven. I'm happy and stoked and cheering, and right before we get through the pearly gates, the roller coaster goes down, straight down, into the earth and into the fire and into hell. And I can hear blood-curdling screams for help. So much agony and terror. It was the most awful thing I've ever experienced. I could feel the burn of the fire and the pain of the screams surrounding me. Finally, I wake up and the sun's up. I am covered in sweat. And I look over to see my girlfriend in the fetal position, shaking and crying. I ask her what's wrong, knowing that I already know the answer, but hoping it was something else. All she could say was, the girl, the girl. I asked her what happened and she said she saw a little girl in a white dress standing in the middle of the room staring at us and dancing. She claimed she wasn't even asleep. She went on to explain how she'd wake up periodically, 
to see the rocking chair just rocking its butt off. I hadn't even told her what I had seen, and she just confirmed everything, which made everything so much worse. I don't have an exciting end to this story. The next night and the night after, I didn't sleep. There was a Pawn Stars marathon on TV, thank God, and I stayed up all night with the lights on, blasting Pawn Stars to stay awake. I didn't sleep again until the car ride home. Caitlin and I talked about it maybe once or twice and then never spoke of it again. I'll never actually know what happened that night or if I was just crazy. All I can say for sure is I'm never going anywhere near that town again. As much as I'd like answers, I think I'd rather just forget about this one. I've had sleep paralysis before. I get it like once every two years. But every time that happens, I wake up in the same spot where I'm paralyzed. The first time I slept on the couch after a long day at school and saw a dark figure opening the window and walking toward me. I woke up at the same spot I'd fallen asleep in and nothing happened. The second time I was sleeping in my room, Friday night, and I saw a woman with a knife coming for me and cutting my hand. I woke up in the same spot I'd fallen asleep in and again, nothing happened. But the third time is something that I think is pretty insane. The third time, I don't think it was sleep paralysis at all, but a memory that came back. I was at my girlfriend's house and I was sleeping on my left side. My girl is next to me on the right. She was awake. She tries to wake me up, but I fall asleep again. And then I felt like I was lost in a deep, forgotten memory. My girlfriend and I were messing around with our speaker that we have. It has multiple options like Bluetooth and aux. While trying to change stations, we're engaging with a new sound like space radio or something like that. When you hear a lot of strange single noises of different electronic devices, it's like that. The second that hits, I'm getting kicked back by gravity into the bed laying down, paralyzed on the right side of the bed, when my girlfriend is sitting on my right at the edge of the bed, looking straight down, with her hand leaning onto the bed, paralyzed as well. When this happens, I hear a loud, deep, mixed voice, not humans, but speaking in English, which is not my native language. It was inside my head, but it was also so loud that I can't think of anything else. All I hear, like it's some really important message, is the world, the will, over and over again. It was like they wanted me to remember this somehow, but chose to bring that experience to me just at that moment. The voice in my head was strong, but I shivered. I felt like somebody was tasering my head. I felt like I wasn't in control. I somehow understood that my brain couldn't take it anymore and I was trying to wake up, but nothing helped. Until I suddenly wake up, stressed out and reaching for my girlfriend, asking her if I was talking in my sleep or moving or doing anything that showed signs of a nightmare, but nothing. She says I was sleeping like a baby right next to her. I found nothing about the world, the will, but I believe that it was a real encounter. My girlfriend doesn't remember any of it, but it's terrifying just to think about it. After all, it might be a memory of mind control or aliens or something. Or it could just be a really bad sleep paralysis dream, but I don't think so. The red light that was around this whole situation is the fact that I wasn't at the same side of the bed, and I always wake up at the same spot I get paralyzed in when I have sleep paralysis. I have two reasons for sharing this story. One of them is to see if anyone else has encountered this message, the world, the will. Maybe it's something from a movie that I heard once, or maybe it's something else. The other reason, I guess, is just to see if anybody knows what I might have experienced. If you have any ideas, please let me know.
This story happened many years ago, around the months of June and July. My family and I often go up and vacation at a cabin in Yungaburra, Cairns, Australia during the winter. We do this as we miss the cold days that we would get from our hometown of Toowoomba during the winter, as Cairns is tropical, so it's summer 24-7. Yungaburra is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that if you blink, you'll miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical, with about 150 or more years of heritage. As usual with rich heritage and small towns, local folk legends from over the years accumulated. One of these legends ended up coming true. We rented this cabin that was on the brink of bushlands, and it was next door to an old farmhouse that has quite a bit of land, including some of the bushland the cabin backed onto. To get to the cabin, you had to walk up a somewhat steep dirt road that also leads to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium-sized pond that ran along it. This dirt road came off one of the main streets of Yungaburra. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungaburra. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He, on the other hand, did not have anywhere to drive the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. It got to about 11.30 and I decided that I'd better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15 minute walk. So after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized that not driving was a dumb idea as it was about five Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper on and that was it. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder and I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway, and God did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was very wrong. After I turned my flashlight on, fog started to roll in. At first it was only light fog, but it continued and developed into heavy fog and then it surpassed heavy fog, and then I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, well, here we fucking go, something's about to happen, get it over and done with. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew that there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom, and the last thing I wanted was to fall into it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance, a small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard, son, is that you? Come here out of the fog, follow the lamp. It was my mom. I couldn't yet see her, so instead I followed the light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up the steps and I heard the door open, so I knew that I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction that I had seen it last. I was calling out for my mom to turn it back on, and there was no reply. I finally ran into a wooden guardrail, literally, and some steps. I walked up the steps and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I wasn't home. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swaying open in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There are three things you do in this type of situation. The three F's, if you will. Flight, fight, or freeze. And I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mom's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then that I realized I would rather be out in the fog than standing on the doorstep of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs 
I heard the voice, now yelling, My son, where are you going? I started to sprint, but as I was running, I smashed my foot and leg against some sort of stone and fell flat onto the ground. It took a chunk out of my knee, and I had cuts all along my hands. I still have some scars from it. I turned around and realized that I had not tripped over a stone. Well, not any stone. I had tripped over a tombstone. At this point I screamed, got up, and started to run even more. I was screaming for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped. I thought that I got far enough away from the house. Until little amber lights, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and ran for it. Yet again, I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the metal at the end was just my life. Before I knew it, slam, I ran straight into a wall with my head being the contact point. I blacked out, and from what I can remember, I was woken up by my dad who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently, when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night, and any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me some time to rest. This also gave me time to ring up my friend so he could come over, and perhaps give me some insight into what I had experienced and what my dad saw. He and I sat out on the patio. I could see the farmhouse, only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend, according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first ones built, late 19th century, during the 1910s or something. A well-known mother, Anne was her name, had let her son play with some of his mates down on the main stretch of town one day. It started to get late, and as it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then, heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go looking for him. As she walked down, she could hear his footsteps, and she told him to follow the lamp. When she made her way back to the house, she was not accompanied by her son. It wasn't until the next morning that they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He had hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently that of her son's. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late, cold, dark nights, mistaking them for her own lost son. The young Abura fog is one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. I've gotten used to generic things, stuff moving, stuff missing, shadows, all that sort of thing. So I wanted to share something truly unique that happened to me. Six years ago, my boyfriend at the time, husband now, woke me up sweating and shaking in absolute fear. I asked him what was wrong and he began stuttering and telling me that I would never believe him. He went on to tell me that he was woken up around midnight to this person standing at the end of the bed. Yes, my first thought was sleep paralysis as well, but he sat up and was ready to attack if he needed to. In his head, he heard a voice that wasn't him, telling him that it was okay and that they weren't there for any bad reasons. He said he felt immediately calm from that. He also noted that he was shocked with what a light sleeper I was and that his movements hadn't woken me. This being was unnaturally tall and had to crouch a little due to its height and us having been asleep in the basement. He said that this being reached out for a greeting and again began hearing a voice in his head saying, Hello. Nothing much else happened that night as my husband was frightened. All he remembered at the time was that the last thing he heard from it in his mind was, I'll see you again soon. And then he said it felt as if time had started again, not realizing that it ever felt like it stopped until that point. And then he was back in reality, and that's when he woke me. 
What he thought had only been about a 10 to 15 minute encounter had actually taken over an hour. These visits continued for months, minimum once a week, max three to four times, but my husband got less and less frightened every time. This thing and him built a sort of friendship from what he explained to me. It had a name, but for the life of me, I can't remember what he said it was. It answered any and every question my husband had. I won't go into what those were here, but after a while, it just stopped. He stopped waking me up in the middle of the night or telling me about it the next morning. But the times were always the same. He would be awoken around midnight and they would have discussions about literally anything my husband was curious about. And then he would come back to reality and time would unfreeze again between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., having only felt like the encounter had lasted a short period of time. Once it stopped, though, I can't emphasize enough just how much it stopped. I mean, full stop. It was like for him, it never happened. It's been six years, so I know this is choppy, but it's hard to remember everything with it having been so long ago now. I forgot about it for so long, and I don't know what prompted me to remember it just about a week ago, but now I just can't stop thinking about it and the oddness of it all, and how it just stopped so suddenly. He's literally never made mention of it ever again, and I've never brought it up to him this last week in fear that he may think I'm crazy, which I don't know why that's my fear, but part of me thinks if there's a chance he's completely forgotten it, whether it be on his own or something else, he may think I've gone insane. Anyway, if you have any ideas or similar stories, please let me know. I'm trying to figure this all out and what happened to my husband, as it's literally keeping me up at night. To preface this entire post and give complete transparency, I've been a long-time lurker of paranormal and ghost-related subreddits and websites since I was a little kid with access to the internet. I have always been a believer in the paranormal. However, I have also been a very hard skeptic, as I have never dealt with anything paranormal in my entire life until this event. There's a ton of people on subreddits like these that conjure up BS stories to practice their writing, and it bugs me to no end that there are unfortunately no sure ways to tell what's real and what's somebody's fictional narrative writing anymore. It blurs the line between reality and fiction and with people's experiences like mine. With that said, this event messed me up and it still keeps me up at night to this day. I have nothing to gain from retelling this experience here. I was convinced by some of my closest friends to post my experience, even if this did happen a long time ago. This happened almost a year ago. My girlfriend and I visited her parents' house, which was her old home in Alabama, specifically Crenshaw County. For those that don't know, that's basically in the middle of nowhere, the boonies, the sticks. Being from a large city myself in Southern California, I'm completely out of my element. I've already visited her parents once before with her. She's always told me her house was haunted and that the woods were sketchy at night. But when I visited the first time with her, nothing happened whatsoever. So I chalked it up as some tall tale to creep me out, play with the city boy. That is until we visited her parents the second time. Her father works in Montgomery for the weekdays, so he's gone a lot. And her mother had to be in Atlanta for three days due to a job. We were home alone for those three days, unless you want to count her cats as well. The one story house is in the middle of absolute nowhere with the nearest house down the road from us aways. One of those nights around 12 a.m., I'm sitting in my bed with her, completely asleep. I'm scrolling through Facebook and Twitter when I began hearing what sounded like my girlfriend's voice coming from her. I turned to look at her to see if she's sleep talking, but nothing. 
She's quiet. I continue going through my notifications for a bit, and I hear her again. This time, though, it sounds like it's coming from outside, behind the bedroom wall, toward the same direction as my girlfriend, and much louder and echoey. I get up, and I look around to see if any television is on, or if any of the cats are making noises, even though the TVs aren't in the direction I heard the voice from. But nothing. The TVs are off, and the cats are asleep or just quietly lazing around. I even checked her phone, which was on the nightstand to my right, just in case it was playing audio or something, but nothing. It was just charging. I go back to bed with her and continue going about my business, but this time I'm looking out for the voice. This time I hear it again, but much clearer and louder. It sounds exactly like my girlfriend's voice, and this time I knew for sure it was coming from outside. I know this because she's sleeping on my left, and toward my left is also the wall, on the other side of which is a clearing and then all dense woods. After this, I shift all of my focus and all of my attention to the loud voice, seeing if I hear it again. This is the part where I internally start saying, no, nah, I'm done. I'm not finding out what you are. I've seen way too many movies and YouTube videos, and I know that I'm not going out there to find out. I heard the voice one more time, yet this time it didn't sound closer, just a little farther, which leads me to believe that it's something physically moving around the clearing bordering the woods. The scariest thing about the voice that got me freaked out, though, it was still clear enough that I started making out human speech, but it was messed up. Like, it was speaking in phrases using my girlfriend's voice, but none of the words made any sense. It's like it was trying to speak English, but it came out reversed or something. At that point, I did one final check around the house to see if all the doors were locked. My rational mind was thinking it was probably just a lost somebody in the woods. Definitely not a Wendigo or a skinwalker or whatever. I made sure the curtains were closed, and I just went to bed. I told my girlfriend the very next morning, and she seemed rightfully freaked out, but we ended up cracking jokes about it to cope. I posted this experience to Facebook about a week after and a lot of my friends threw around thoughts that it could very well have been something paranormal. A friend of my girlfriend who studies cryptozoology asked me a ton of questions relating to the incident, and basically flat out said, yeah, that's a Wendigo. Yet, I don't know how credible of an opinion that would be. I'm inching into believing it, because what I heard that night was exactly my girlfriend's voice. I swear I could make out my name in the garbled up speech that I was hearing, but I'm not too sure on that much. Like it was trying to lure me into the woods. Whatever it was, it had my girlfriend's voice, pitch, tone, and patterns just right enough for me to listen, but not enough to get me out there with it. I haven't been back since, but we are planning to go back in October and to go to Disney World with her family. I'm just hoping that whatever it was, isn't there anymore. This incident happened in 1963 in BC. I was 22 and on my honeymoon when I saw a creature, what I would later call a Bigfoot. I saw it in the clear light of day, free of any obstruction, and I have thought about it every day since. My husband and I were camping in the Broken Islands. It was early June, and the weather was beautiful. It was about seven in the evening, and I walked to the edge of the water and began to wade out. The water came up to just below my shorts. I stood there and admired the beauty. The sun had not started to set yet, and there was a peaceful stillness at that moment. My husband was asleep in the tent, and I thought to wake him so we could cook dinner together. I turned back toward the beach, and it was standing there, motionless. I didn't hear it make a sound, 
The beachhead was gravel, and rocks that crunched and clicked as we moved around were everywhere. But I didn't hear this thing at all. I couldn't understand what I was looking at and just stood, frozen. My eyes were going all over its body, trying to comprehend. I thought it was a naked man at first. It was taller than me by a wide margin. I was five foot eight and this probably was over a foot taller. It was lean and lanky, like a basketball player. It hunched at the shoulders, had long arms that hung at its sides in a non-threatening manner. It had long fingers with black nails. It stood with its legs close together and had long feet, just like its hands and fingers. It had a round head and the face looked like a person, but different. Something was off. The body was covered in a brownish hair, but its body outline was still visible. The hair stuck up like an orangutan. The skin on the hands, feet, and face was visible and grayish, dusty and ashy looking. Its eyes were black and I couldn't see any other color. We just stood there looking at each other. I was stunned and it was indifferent. He never looked away, but he had an expression of indifference. I said, hello, in a broken half whisper. I couldn't think of what else to do. He smiled at me. His lips peeled back, revealing large teeth like a horse's. They looked too big and square for the mouth. When I looked at it in the face, the eyes at that moment, I realized that this was not a person. It was like a person, but it was something different. A wave of nausea overtook me. I began to vomit and felt faint. The world started to spin. I moved toward the shore and fell on my hands and knees. I heaved with such force into the dirt. The spinning stopped and I sat up. He was gone. I was there on my knees and just kept replaying the incident in my head for I don't know how long. I stripped off my clothes and cleaned myself in the water. The sun was beginning to set and I got dressed and lay next to my husband. I don't remember sleeping, just fever, chills and dizziness. We left the next day. I never told my husband what I saw. We split up five years later. I live in Texas. I've remarried, had children, grandchildren, gotten divorced again and remarried again. I never told a soul about what I saw. I would go to the library and look for books about monsters, trying to understand what it was, that thing I saw. Bigfoot became popular in the late 60s and 70s. I saw the infamous PGF footage. That's not like what I saw. What I stood staring at, what changed me forever, was something else. I came from a typical Texas, all-American family. I wasn't supposed to see this. Now I'm someone with a secret, something I could never talk about in my real life. My interest in this subject has been a complete secret. No one who knows me would ever guess. I have never said this out loud. But in 1963, I saw a Bigfoot. This happened to me back in 2013. I was 18 at the time. I was a healthy, normal woman by all accounts and lived in a suburb of South Florida. Just at that juncture in my life, I was moving up north to UF, which is in Gainesville. Aside from the university, it's a very boring town, mostly nothing up there. I had noticed that before moving there and during my time there, once a month, always on the same night, I think the first Sunday of every month, I wouldn't be able to sleep. Without fail, I couldn't sleep. I would toss and turn all night. 
Sometimes after those nights, I would wake up with something strange on my body. Once on my lower spine, right on the spinal cord, I woke up with a large red bump, perfectly centered. It wasn't itchy like a bug bite, and it was unlike a pimple. Another time, I awoke with a scar across my lower abdomen. It was long, and unlike a scratch. It was brown, like it had been cauterized. But it left my body within a day or two, like a scratch might have. On one such Sunday, my boyfriend happened to be spending the night. It was my parents' rule that he would sleep in a separate bedroom, but before he went off to his room, he laid next to me in my bed for a little while and we talked. He was saying something when, suddenly, he went quiet and looked behind him. I asked him what was the matter, but he shrugged it off. He went to his room and we both tried to sleep. However, like usual on these nights, I tossed and turned, unable to sleep. A feeling of dread prevented me from sleeping. I got restless and decided to go sleep in the room with my boyfriend, hoping that I might be able to relax with him there. But still I couldn't sleep. I would nearly doze off, only to awake in a fright, which was really uncharacteristic of me. I gave up and went back to my own room until I suddenly gave in and fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I told my boyfriend that I couldn't sleep all night and that I felt like something was coming to get me. He told me at that moment, the previous night when he suddenly fell silent mid-conversation, it was because he thought he saw something outside of my window. He said that for whatever reason, the first thing that came to his mind was aliens and that it froze him with fear. He also told me that shortly after I had returned to my own room in the middle of the night, he was disturbed by a loud static noise and felt vibrations in the air. After a few months, these routine, monthly sleepless nights stopped, and they never returned. I still don't know what it was all about, or if it was even anything at all. But that night put both of us on edge. I went on a trip to Cambodia years ago to visit relatives. I was always a skeptic and a non-believer in anything paranormal. To this day though, this is the experience that made me a believer. One night, my dad and I decided to stay at my cousin's house. They have a large multi-level home outside the city of Phnom Penh in a small village named Svai Rolom. The bedroom I was staying in was upstairs and had its own bathroom, and I was excited to get cleaned up before dinner. As I was in the shower, soap in my hair, I heard somebody call my name. I don't respond right away because surely they can hear that I'm occupied and showering. A second later, I heard my name again, this time slightly louder and closer to the bathroom door. Annoyed, I turned off the water, grabbed a towel, and answered back, Yes? When I didn't get a response, I opened the door and looked around the bedroom. The bedroom door was closed and nothing had been moved. I assumed that whoever it was, they must have just left. After I finished my shower, I headed downstairs to the backyard where everybody was, and I asked who had just been looking for me because I heard somebody call my name while I was in the shower. Confused, everybody said that they had all been sitting right where they were, just talking. I brush it off, thinking that maybe I was just exhausted from the day. It was a warm night and there was a full moon out. So we enjoyed our dinner outside. The electricity turns off all throughout the village at a certain time and it doesn't come back on until morning. So I headed to my room when we had 15 minutes left so that I could get ready for bed. I was exhausted and I quickly fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to find that I couldn't breathe. I could move, but I couldn't breathe. I was choking for what seemed like a few seconds. Suddenly I was able to breathe again and I calmed down. I fell back asleep 
only to suddenly wake up choking again. This time it seemed slightly longer than the last. I panicked and sat up in bed, trying to gasp for air. When my breath finally came back, I stood up and walked around the room, wondering what was going on with me. I had never had an episode like that. I was young, in excellent health. What could it be? After about 30 minutes, I was starting to feel sleepy once more, so I laid down. Once again, I woke up and it was happening all over. I'm gasping for air. I sit up in bed and I still can't breathe. I quickly sprung out of bed and I was still choking. My breath hadn't come back. And just as I thought I was going to pass out, I was able to breathe again. The moonlight was bright and was coming through the window. As I was standing there, catching my breath, I thought I saw a shadow quickly move across the wall in front of me. I sat in bed, and for the first time in a long time, I said a prayer. When I started to feel calmer, I went back to sleep. Nothing happened for the rest of the night. The next morning, I decided not to tell anybody about what had happened the night before. We had a busy day. There was a Buddhist ceremony at the house and a blessing. I was meeting with friends of family and other relatives, and toward the end of the day, I was talking to my older cousin, who's from the United States. She tells me that the monks are there blessing the house because there might be some restless spirits. She went on, giving me an example of the very room that I was staying in that belongs to my other cousin. He refuses to stay in that room at night because he always hears somebody calling his name and pulling at his legs in the night. That was the last night that I stayed in that house. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story. This happened just before my senior year of high school, over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Advil for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you, I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m., and this occurred while driving home from my boyfriend's house at the time, which took roughly 15 minutes, so let's say about 10.45 at night. I was full of energy at this age, and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. In fact, I was hyped up with the warm summer nighttime breeze, car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through the back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its cops. They could be jerks. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat, so I could really speed and that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I would take a right turn, which was more than 90 degrees, almost back the way I had come from. Then, in exactly a half a mile, I would turn left onto the long, straight road, where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much, because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel, and it would have been a waste as I would have just had to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where this all went down. A house had recently been built there, two stories with a detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected. We built our family house and it took us a year to finish it. I'll start at the beginning because I believe that this is all related. Week one. I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. 
I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just be bopping along, when my lights illuminate something stunning, sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf, a real wolf, a solid white real wolf. I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and I've even met a quarter wolf in person. They look different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and just blowing my mind. I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it. And I notice that it's not minding me at all. It's sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road, staring at the house. Almost unblinking, its ears didn't even flick toward me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to behave like that, even less for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric, like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Native American stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay though. Mom would never believe me if I told her I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I had gotten to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week two, I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolf buddy, hoping to see him again around that area. So I drove extra slowly with my window down and my radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road approaching the new little house. Then I saw the, the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity, my reality, and the possibility of eldritch terrors as Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox its limbs folded and pulled in tight with its hunched posture, yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor sharp teeth. The upper half of its body looked emaciated with barely more than frog-like thin skin, pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright. And at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terrible long fingers. While its legs had bulk to them and looked equipped for running, with the back-facing knees for sprinting and tipped in raptor-like curved claws, it also looked emaciated it looked tall, maybe seven feet or more, just folded up into this predator's posture, waiting for prey. Then there were its eyes, solid black and sunken. I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. I knew it was going to happen. I knew that it was going to look at me. It was going to see me and there was nothing I could do to avoid it. Panic and a terror unique to this alien thing swallowed me instantly, feeling like I was tilting off the world. The world that I had always known and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up, or I would be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car and I would become an unsolved mystery. I knew it in the core of my being. I had a manual crank window. 
Why, you might ask? Because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car. But at that moment, I realized that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning toward me, and I had to let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I just knew I had to get that window up first. I was cranking it as hard as I could. I started to cry as I finally got the window closed, and then I put my gas pedal to the floor gravel road be damned. I thought to myself, I must not look at it as I pass. I must not look at it or make any direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things. I had already seen too much. My tires had found grip and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed. I'm really screwed. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had snot and tears rolling down my face, and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see the darkness as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick that I had learned before to tap my brakes softly enough that the light came on, but not so hard that I actually slowed down. It's a way to see behind you in the dark. Red lit up the dust that was billowing my way, but amidst the swirling chaos, I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest, a tall, thin shadow. I had had enough and decided that I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back. I was going to drive 109 miles per hour, which is fast as I can go before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a ride onto the highway and flew home. I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I did not. When I got home, nobody was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time. So I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain it. He was dismissive and thought that I was pulling a joke on him. And when he realized I wasn't, he thought that I was crazy or seeing things. There are many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity contributed. Week three. I absolutely refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have had to leave my boyfriend's house a little early, and he'd been making fun of me about it all week. One of the days that we went to a park to walk around, he decided that on the way back, he wanted to drive by that house where I'd seen the thing. I was hysterical, begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded. So as we got closer, and I realized I couldn't stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down, cowering in panic. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night. At one point, he stopped the car and said, you have to see this. I said, no, and resisted him pulling at my arm. No, you really have to see this, look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone, burnt clear down to the foundation with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect large circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted, no, no, let's get out of here. I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit 
using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. There was no evidence of any personal belongings, he said. No furniture, no power wiring, no interior walls. It doesn't seem like other burnt houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area. There weren't any. He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered, as they didn't know about a fire there and didn't have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. Talking about it still makes my chest tighten. It makes my skin crawl and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it. A thing that's nothing like any creature known to humans. But I saw it. But still, the other part of me says it can't exist. If you've heard of something that matches this description, let me know. I'd love to find some answers. This all happened near Moulton, Alabama. So if you live in the area and you know what this thing might be, I'd love to hear about it. An Aswang is a monster in Filipino mythology that preys on pregnant women. Unlike the grisly attacks usually shown in horror movies, however, these monsters apparently just prey on the life essence of the unborn baby until it dies and the mother miscarries. The scary part is that these monsters are also part human, meaning that during the day, they could literally be anyone. This happened in Metro Manila in around 2011. My cousin told me the old man with the new neighbors asked me if he were pregnant. I was shocked. I never even told my family yet. I was 21 and worked nights in a call center. I never go outside when I'm home and I was only a few weeks along, so I know I wasn't showing yet. How did this nosy old man know? She said the neighbors were new in town, coming from one of the more popular provinces in the Philippines, where witchcraft and Aswans are still the norm. They were friendly enough though, so no one really had anything bad to say about them other than the nasty rumors that they knew about Aswan. When I was about eight months along, I was watching late night TV with my brother at around 2 a.m. Something big landed on our tin roof, strong enough to rattle the windows. My brother and I looked at each other with wide eyes as we listened to the footsteps. Yes, footsteps. Stop right above me. I was never a prayerful person, but at that moment, I called on gods and saints and angels and anything to protect my baby. Then I remembered my grandmother's story about how she escaped an Aswang attack by placing a pillow between her legs to mask the baby's scent. So I did just that. We had no idea how long we waited, seconds, minutes, but then we heard another jump and silence. Until this very day, I'm glad that my brother was with me to vouch for me. I still couldn't believe that it happened and that it happened to me. Then I remembered the nosy old man. Could it have been him? Was he really an Aswang? Something weird and mysterious and unfinished, I suppose, but all's well that ends well, right? I like stories about the paranormal, but I've never personally experienced anything, and I tend to be pretty skeptical about them. However, there was a weird experience that I wanted to share and see what people thought about. Back in 2009, I was in college a couple of hours away from home. My grandparents, who I lived with through the last two years of high school, were away from home at their second property, where they were building their retirement home for the weekend and I wanted to get off campus. So my friends, let's call them Jess and Nina, 
and I decided to go to the house for the weekend. My friend Jess claims to be sensitive. She has told me stories about things coming into her room when she was growing up, and I can tell she's genuine. But to my knowledge, science has yet to demonstrate the existence of any kind of life after death, so I remain skeptical. I could tell something was off as soon as we pulled up to the house. I'm grabbing my bag from the truck, and I look over to her to see her staring up at the house. I ask her if she's okay, and she just says one word, Occupado, and then proceeds to grab her bag from the truck and we all head inside. Let me give you the layout. The house was built in the 80s and my grandparents bought the place in 99. The previous owner had died in the home, in his sleep, I think. It was a two-story brick home that backed up to a lake. It was quite a nice place to live, but there were also parts of the house that always used to creep me out for some reason. The front sitting room and dining room upstairs and the stairs to the basement where I lived in high school. But like I said, I never experienced anything. Anyway, my grandparents knew that we were coming down for the weekend, but they were going to be gone for a while. So they shut off all the water in the house, except for to the downstairs bathroom. We all go inside and a few hours later, Jess decides to go downstairs to use the bathroom. Nina and I stay upstairs watching a movie. She's gone for quite some time, and when she comes back upstairs, she asks us what we wanted while she was in the bathroom. Nina and I just look at each other, confused. We hadn't left the room and we hadn't called for her. We didn't know what she was talking about. She asks if either one of us had come downstairs and tried to turn the bathroom door handle while she was in there. We looked at her, incredulous, and tell her that we had not. She grows pale, and my heart starts to race. I think someone is in my house. Nina and I grab knives from the kitchen and go room to room searching for an intruder. We find nothing. The house is quiet for the rest of the weekend. I still think about that sometimes. I don't know what it was. Maybe my friend was daydreaming and maybe she got into her own head. Maybe she was messing with us, although she swears up and down that she wasn't, and she looked genuinely terrified. Maybe there was someone in the house, though I'm pretty sure we would have heard them opening a door. Also, there was a security system that beeped if any door or window were opened. I just don't know. What do you think? This happened in around 1954, in Hilbro, Johannesburg, South Africa. My grandparents lived in Hilbro at the time after my grandfather returned from the Korean War, flying for the SAAF and finding work in the mines. He loved being a pilot, but with a growing family, he took a job with the mines, paying much, much more. From the beginning, the house they lived in just didn't seem right. Strange things would happen, like blankets being pulled off at night, with nobody there. Movement could be seen from the corner of the eye, and my aunt, who was around three at the time, would talk to someone standing in the door when my grandmother gave her a bath, someone that only she could see. One morning, everybody was either at school, kindergarten, or at work when my grandmother was getting dressed to go to the shops. She was in her underwear when she saw a nun standing in her room. Her blood froze in her veins when she saw this old nun. Suddenly, at a fast pace, the nun walked toward my grandmother, shouting, Hurry up! Go! Go! They need you! Go now! As quickly as she appeared, she was gone. My grandmother was out of her mind with fear and ran outside, struggling to open the locked front door. She managed to run outside and scream in the street. It wasn't until an elderly lady from next door ran outside and covered my grandmother with a jacket that she realized she was still in her underwear. 
After going back inside the house with the elderly lady accompanying her, she explained what had happened. The neighbor explained to my grandmother that this was foreboding and that something bad was probably going to happen. Her words weren't even out of her mouth before the telephone rang. It was the mines, informing her that my grandfather had been injured in a rock fall underground. He was okay, but taken to the hospital with a broken leg. A lot of strange things would happen to them in the future, especially after they moved to the new-founded gold mining town of Welcome in 1957, my hometown. I should lead by saying that I tend to lean towards skepticism when it comes to the paranormal. I 100% believe that paranormal entities exist. However, more often than not, I think people psych themselves out rather than have a genuine paranormal experience. In fact, that's why it's taken me so long to follow up on my situation. I'm reconsidering the weight of the situation now based on the behaviors of people that have been around this artifact that I have, as well as some of the things that have happened to me while I was looking into it. About two years ago, I found myself volunteering at an orphanage in Uganda for six months. I decided to go out there as a way to recover from my alcoholism and move forward with my life. While I was in Uganda, I also ended up being involved with getting a primary school started and I assisted in getting a nonprofit off the ground. I was actually offered the position of operations manager at the nonprofit when I left the country. And the school was named after my friend and I in our honor. The point is, I was working really hard to have a good future, and I had succeeded in my recovery. In my last month in Uganda, a fellow volunteer gave me a gift. It was a Coptic cross that he had picked up in Ethiopia while he was on his way back into Uganda. I thought it was super cool and unique, so I got some string and fashioned it into a necklace to bring back to the States. I think it's important to note that the guy who gave it to me came from Trinidad and Tobago and outspokenly hated Americans. We clashed occasionally but we both understood that we came from different places and ideas and just agreed to disagree. To be clear though, 90% of the time we were friends and on good terms. The very first peculiar experience happened to me about six months after I had gotten back home. I was in line to check out in a grocery store when I saw a man who looked like he was from Africa. It's hard to explain, but when you've been in a place long enough, you can pick up on their demeanor and their clothing and things like that. The man was just walking by when he looked at me, then at my necklace, and then back at me, but this time with a look of absolute terror. At the time, I didn't think much of it, but still, it stuck with me. Before my second experience, I had some friends comment on my necklace. I was told that it had some sort of weight to it, and that something about it felt weird. I ended up asking some co-workers about it since I knew some of them were heavy believers in the spirit realm. After I took it out and showed them, nobody was comfortable standing any closer than five feet from me. They prayed for me and sent me home with a prayer book, which they claimed would keep me protected. At this point, I began to get paranoid and I began recounting weird occurrences in my apartment. One example is that my two-week-long writer's block with my music production suddenly ceased when I moved the necklace out of my studio and into another room. I kept thinking of similar circumstances. The only problem here was that I couldn't quite convince myself that I wasn't just falling victim to my own placebo. I also remember the very distinct feeling of being watched and I never really felt alone after that. One night, after overcoming my usual nightly restlessness, I fell into the comforts of sleep. The next thing I know, I had started a business in my hometown. A car wash, actually. I was showing a friend the place, and I let us all into the office. 
Everything in my office was neatly placed in its spot, just as it should have been. Suddenly, a man appeared walking past the doorway that exited from the side of the office into a car wash bay. Everything about the man's appearance was average. What was unsettling, though, was that I could tell that he knew I was watching him, even though he wasn't looking at me. It was just a gut feeling. The man disappeared as soon as I got a good look at him. I walked out the door in an attempt to see where he went. The man was nowhere to be seen. I walked back inside the side door of the office, and everything was trashed. I looked over at my friend and said that we needed to get the hell out of there. I led the way out of the front door, and laying on the ground in front of my feet was a horse. The horse was barely alive and was quite clearly in excruciating pain. I noticed it was missing two legs, one in the front and one in the rear. It was at that moment I realized I was in a dream and I felt my subconscious start to panic. When I finally woke up, I was sweating and terrified. Needless to say, that sleep was not something I was going to attempt again that night. I was seriously freaked out and decided to look into the possibility of a haunting. A week later, I found myself in the home of a spiritualist. I had made sure to leave the necklace outside to see if she could sense it as a sort of vetting process. I also made a point to be aware not to make any hints toward my experience, and more importantly, that necklace. She had told me that she felt the presence of a demon about me, and that it was not from the necklace that I had left outside. Since I made sure not to mention anything that could lead her to know about that necklace, I trusted her reading. However, I politely left after she gave me an estimate for $200 to solve my problem. I know she needs to pay her bills too, I just didn't quite have that much money at the time. A week and a half later, I went to the office of my friend's pastor's friend. She was a Christian counselor who just so happened to have some expertise in the subject. I'm not a Christian, but I figured that it wasn't really a big deal since not everybody in counseling is a Christian. So, the appointment moved forward and I told her everything that had happened. She responded by doing some forearm muscle tests, which revealed that there were seven demons in me. She was able to relinquish six of them, and then things quickly escalated. Apparently the seventh demon was a tier above most, and can't be renounced with spiritual faith. I admitted that I wasn't a Christian, but leaned toward agnosticism. I didn't think it was a problem because I answered that question in the introduction packet she gave me when I first walked in. Long story short, she berated me for 20 minutes, told me I was going to be stuck with this demon until the day that I'm a devout man of God, shamed me for coming to a Christian counselor without being a Christian, and charged me more than we initially agreed on. I think it's important to note that I don't think this is normal behavior for her. I obviously didn't know her very well, but the shift in her demeanor was huge. I honestly couldn't even recognize her when she got angry. Apparently she's been in business for years, and I can't imagine she would be remotely successful if she went off on every client that was simply looking for help, but didn't align with her point of view. I suspect it might have been induced, but nonetheless, I left her office hurt and angry. A week or two later, I decided to go out to Haiti to volunteer for disaster relief. I'm in my motel in Miami overnight, with a flight out to Port-au-Prince the next day. That night, I woke up with sleep paralysis. I've read stories about it, and realized it was important to stay calm and wait for the rest of my body to wake up. Suddenly, my legs were thrown out from under me, across the bed. My torso felt like it was being pushed around. The next minute consisted of my body being thrown helplessly around the bed while I quietly prayed with all of my might. When I did, it ended abruptly, and I waited until the sun rose to relax. I ended up missing my first flight the next morning by a fluke. I booked another ticket the following day, but I was given the wrong time of my flight, and I missed that one as well. In the last six months, I have lost my jobs, isolated myself from friends, I am practically homeless, and I have had to file for bankruptcy. 
my ever so promising career in music is now gone and I am ashamed of myself because I never made it out to Haiti. I don't know if there is any merit to paranormal interference. I can chalk up the nightmare to my subconscious thoughts, the sleep paralysis to muscle spasms, and everything else to paranoia. But the unexplainable portions are, well, unexplained. Edit. Yesterday, I drove up to a spot on the mountain that I know pretty well. I crossed two creeks and walked a mile into the forest until I found a spot that I could easily recognize. I had the cross wrapped in a cloth that I had drenched in boiled salt water and let dry. I had also cleansed it myself before I left. I dug a small hole by the base of a tree and dropped the cloth-covered cross into the ground. I took out my Bible and read a select verse, prayed for it to leave me alone, and then addressed it directly. I demanded in the name of God that it will not follow me home or bother me anymore, and that it would be staying there. I've come back home, and I've only felt better since. Granted, it's only been a few days, but I've been acting more like myself. My productivity has improved vastly, and most importantly, I don't feel burdened by that feeling of constantly being watched. It looks like that did the trick. Although, if I ever do need to get back the cross, I have the exact coordinates memorized. Growing up, I dealt with what every child that comes from a military family has to deal with. Constantly making new friends and losing friends because their parents or my father would move to a new station. This time, we were leaving Arizona, and once again, we're going to Germany. But before I, my sisters, and my mother could join him, we had to stay in a small town in Ohio with my grandparents. My father either had to seek out the right-sized accommodations off-base, or just wait for base housing to become available. In Ohio, it was the kind of town where everybody knows each other. The kind of town that had corner stores that all the kids loved because they had the best candies, and the owner was just the friendliest old gent you've ever met. The blink-and-you'll-miss-it kind of town. My grandparents' house was beautiful, huge, and old. I'm not entirely sure when it was built, but judging by the electrical outlets, light switches, narrow doorways, and old doors with the rustic knobs and keyholes, I'd say it was sometime in the late 40s to 50s. It sat next to a creek that my cousins and I would often go play in and catch frogs to torment my sister with. I loved this house, except for two areas that I would avoid, the attic and the basement with the partial earthen floor, low ceiling, and single 40-watt light bulb to illuminate the one room. I went to the basement just once to check on the laundry for my grandmother, and I refused to go down there ever again. I wouldn't even go near the basement door. Both of those areas just gave me the creeps. The vibes I got from them just put me on edge. I want to say it was just a child's overactive imagination, and that my mind was just playing tricks on me. But I would just be in denial of what I had witnessed in these areas of the house. My older sister and I slept in a bunk bed in a bedroom on the second floor that was in the corner of the house, which was above the kitchen, which was above the basement. And my mother and baby sister shared a bedroom down the hall, which was adjacent to the staircase. Our little bedroom had its own bathroom, which in and of itself was a pretty sweet deal, had it not been for the fact that the attic door was also in the bathroom. This door was unlike any other attic entrance I've ever seen. It was an actual door, child-sized, and in the wall. When it opened, it would creak on its hinges, and there was a hinged set of stairs that you lowered to climb up. This likely added to the creep factor as well. On a previous visit one Christmas, I had gone up to the attic on a dare for my cousins. They told me that there were bats up there, yet had never been up themselves. I was hesitant, but it was during the day, and my cousins were right by the door, 
so I went in. Climbing up the stairs, I was cautiously looking around, not wanting any winged rats flying at me. And what did I see? A rather large attic that could easily have been another bedroom, a few boxes, my dad's archery set, and a wooden chair. None of this could be considered out of the ordinary, and definitely not scary. At this point, I'm willing to bet that you thought I was going to say I saw a chair move or something, but no. In fact, this was the only time that the chair was worth mentioning just because I noticed it. During our first week, my mother asked my sister and I if either of us had gone downstairs for something in the middle of the night. We hadn't. She had heard somebody walking down the hall from our room and down the stairs. She had called out our names and received no reply. She seemed to just shrug it off and go with the old houses make noises explanation. That same night, my sister was in the bathroom brushing her teeth before bed. She said that it felt like somebody was watching her from near the attic door. We both woke up later with that same feeling after hearing that familiar creaking from the attic door. Something was now looking at us from the doorway of the bathroom. We had both seen it, a shadow standing in the dark. We got right out of there and into my mother's room, telling her we saw a ghost. When she groggily inquired as to why we were in her room, we repeated it, and then she begrudgingly made room for us in the bed. We saw this a couple more times during our stay, but that was the only time we ever hightailed it into her room. The one time I had ventured into the basement, I had been checking the laundry for my grandmother. The washing machine's cycle was done, so I thought I'd transfer the laundry to the dryer. With an arm full of damp clothes, I noticed movement near the wall around the earthen floor. I froze and looked directly at a shadow, walking from one wall and into the next. It was bad enough that I was uncomfortable in this basement, but after seeing this, that was enough to keep me out of the room. My sister and I had shared our experiences with my grandparents, but they simply shrugged it off with the old house explanation and said that we were just making up stories to get attention. Then my mother chimed in with her experiences, and this produced an argument that had us leaving and staying with the other grandparents for a time. Soon after, my father had sent for us and we were living in a beautiful three-story home owned by our German landlord and his wife. Both treated us like their own grandchildren, and far better than our own blood. The only incident to report in this new house was a French nanny who got frustrated and gave up trying to teach us French, because we just couldn't get past their equivalent of yes without giggling. When I was around eight years old in approximately 1995, I went to visit a friend's house just up a path and through a court from my house, about a minute away. On the court is a set of flats, which creates an archway that you have to walk through. As I walked back home and through the archway, I heard a low humming noise. I looked over my shoulder to see a typical movie-like shaped spaceship the round disc shape with the dome on top and the circular lighting. The lights didn't shine as such as it was daytime, but I can only now explain them as looking like LED lights, which is why they were so noticeable in the daylight. The UFO was small, no bigger than about three feet wide and maybe a foot and a half high. At that point, I think it's coming for me. So I'm so scared I just start running for home. I'm about 30 seconds away, but the corner to the path is coming up. I'm still trying to watch this thing chase me, and as I get to the corner, it's just behind me. The low hum is deafening. I mean, I can feel it within me. I have to take my eyes off of it for just a second to turn the corner, and as I do round the corner, the light, whether it was natural sunlight or the LED-type lights, went really bright and sounded like a jet plane thundering overhead. I look up as I round the corner and it's right above my head, so close that the breeze it created whipped up my hair. Then, just as it had appeared, it disappeared, suddenly, 
No visual sign of it. But I heard that jet plane noise and low humming noise move away from me. I get home and I tell my mom and dad. They don't believe me. Or they say, I must have mistaken a bird. I told my friend the next day and she rolled on the floor laughing. I stopped telling people after that. But I can still remember it like it was yesterday. And still can't shake the feeling that it was coming for me even though it was so small that I wouldn't have even fit in it. I don't know that that matters, though. I still don't want to know what would have happened if I hadn't made it home. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto. On my last night in town, I came back to my Airbnb at about 11.40 p.m. on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. There's a shrine that you have to walk past on a walkway that goes to and from the Airbnb to other areas of town. It was three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down, and then there was a walkway in the middle, with a museum on the right, a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine and I ask myself this question, why are there two kids hopping a wall? As I see these two little figures hop the wall to my right, I pause and watch what's happening. As they both get down, they run across the path and run all the way to the end of the path by the fork and wait there. I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes. I walk a little closer because that was the way to the Airbnb and I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, very slim but proportionate with a bigger head and pointed ears as white as snow. Their eyes were as big as our eye sockets, but black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes at a small distance. I was maybe 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running around the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the walls behind them. But I slowed down to give these things space. I was freaking out a little bit at this point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. I'm walking back to my Airbnb and I sensed that I was being followed, but I couldn't hear or see anything. I have no idea what I saw. Aliens? Something else? I don't know. Just to preface, I work nights, so I spend most of the time home alone while my brother is at work. Before I go to sleep in the morning, I'll lie in bed and browse Reddit for a bit. Yesterday, I'm in bed, just about to call it a day, when I hear something hit the counter in the kitchen. My aunt likes to walk in sometimes, but I checked the cameras. I'm lazy. And my car is the only one here. I immediately dismiss it and get back to my browsing. Maybe five minutes later, I hear solid footsteps coming down the hall. I drop everything and just listen. Unmistakable sounds of boots slowly walking up and eventually back down the hall. I text my brother to tell him since minor stuff happens sometimes. My dog stares at the walls and closets all the time. Doesn't bark, but just stares and my brother and I joked for a little bit. I get the idea to try and record it on the off chance that I actually catch something, and I got extremely lucky this time. I took about five whole minutes of footage from my bed, since I was getting increasingly nervous about the whole thing, and I didn't want to get up, to be honest. I've trimmed the video and removed the empty film space. Included in this video, which starts off with multiple footsteps coming down the hall, boots, 
It cuts to a closer point of view with a single step and then a thud, ending with me looking out of my room door at the hallway. You can hear it on your phone if you listen closely, but with a Bluetooth speaker, you'll hear everything a lot better. Not going to try to speculate or rationalize anything, I just wanted to share the eeriness. Now that I was able to get this, I can include a couple of photos from months ago when my dog stared into the hallway for about 10 minutes. This will have some context now. When he didn't move for a while, I got a picture time-stamped at 7.34 p.m. He eventually moved over and continued to stare at 7.48 p.m. It never really bothered me then, but now it makes a little more sense. Update. Since my last post about disembodied footsteps, things have gotten louder and weirder. I worked a half day last night, so I got home at about 1 a.m. I had to be quiet since my brother was sleeping in the room next to me. I finally got settled into bed and got a movie on Netflix. A while into it, I started hearing the same footsteps that I heard the other day, except this time it was a lot louder. Of course, I paused the movie and put all of my focus into listening. I stood by the cracked door for 10 to 20 minutes, trying to get a recording of it. I didn't get anything too special. A little while later, I heard them even louder and closer. It was coming from the attic. I stood on top of my bed and got the loudest recording yet. There is obviously someone or something in my attic. It wasn't long after that that my brother's alarm started going off and he got out of bed. I immediately went to him and he flipped out completely and grabbed his gun. I was going to tell him not to go up there, but he handed me his gun before I could. Screw it. I made it up the old ladder and looked toward my room. If there was someone up there, there's nowhere that they could hide when they heard me coming up. Thinking about heading up there again all the way to see if there's anything at all that could be making those noises. Happy birthday to me, I guess. In my life, I've had three UFO experiences. For context, I am a 40-year-old male living in the southeastern United States. I will focus on the second one, since it's the most unquestionable event of the three. In 2015, I was living in Lexington, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia, the state capital. On October 5th of that year, we experienced a thousand-year flood that shut everything down and caused major damage throughout the Lexington, Columbia area. My job requires me to be at work at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, same job I have now as I had then. My job was shut down on account of the flood, but my great and wonderful company decided that I needed to be there the next day to assess the damage, despite the fact that I would have to drive through a flood. Anyway. I woke up at 2, went downstairs, made some coffee, and per my usual morning routine, I stepped outside onto the back porch to have the coffee and enjoy the stillness of the twilight hours in solitude. It was lightly raining, not enough to mind it, and the sky was totally overcast with low clouds. That's important. We were in the suburbs about two blocks off of one of the main drags through town, Sunset Boulevard, 378. We weren't in the sticks, but we weren't metropolitan either. The sky was a slight orange from the streetlights reflecting off of the cloudy sky. Our house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. There were tall, lined trees lining the back and sides of the property. So I'm drinking my coffee, leaning on the banister of the deck, and in front of me in the sky, I can see something moving in my direction. My first thought was, oh, it's an owl or some kind of large bird, judging by the shape. But slowly, as the shape got bigger and bigger, I realized that it looked smaller because it was far away, and once it was overhead, it came into clear view. It moved slowly, but it all happened so fast at the same time. It was overhead, over the house, over the pine trees, but under the clouds. It was a black triangle with a textured pattern on the bottom, 
the only side I could see. The texture is difficult to describe. Adidas makes this soccer shoe called the Nemesis. If you Google it, that's kind of how it looked. Embossed lines, perfectly black. The trees were probably about 40 to 50 feet tall, so I estimate that this thing was probably 60 to 80 feet off the ground, pretty low. It was about the size of your traditional Walmart parking lot. It made absolutely zero noise whatsoever. There were no lights. It moved as with intention, with no deviation in direction, like an air hockey puck perfectly gliding on a fixed trajectory. It was slow, maybe faster than a bicycle, but slower than a car. I don't know, 20 miles per hour if I had to guess. Once it made it over the house, I chased it through the gate on the side of the house, yelling to myself at 2.30 in the morning, what the F was that? What the F was that? In the front yard, I was just looking at it. It just quietly and discreetly skated off into the darkness, perfectly straight on, totally indifferent. I regret not getting any pictures, it just didn't occur to me. It came and went so quickly. In the moment, I just didn't know what to think. It's like my brain had nothing to reference against what I was seeing. It wasn't a bird. It was definitely not a plane. I thought maybe it was a drone, but it was so big and totally silent. It was difficult to process in the moment, but I know what I saw. There's no question about it. Anything outside of your scope of understanding or knowledge is the definition of alien. If I were to make up a story about seeing a UFO, a black silent triangle is probably the last thing I would have come up with. I wonder if the flood had anything to do with its presence. It seemed too wild for it to not be connected somehow. The third encounter I had in my life was when I was stargazing with my son on the same deck at the same house. We have since moved though. I was playing with the Google Sky app because I'm lame and uh, it took a while to get a smartphone. So I was amazed at all the apps, even though they'd been out forever. Anyway, we were finding stars on a clear night and then identifying them with the app. One particularly bright star stood out to the east of us and I overlaid the phone with the star. The app showed nothing in the sky in that region. We calibrated it as well. As soon as I said, Hey, there's no star there. It zoomed across the horizon, stopped, then zoomed up, then blinked out, like an old tube TV turning off. Its movements were very smooth and precise. If I were to hold up a yardstick in front of my field of vision with my arms extended, this thing went from one end to the other in a second. I couldn't tell you what that is in actual distance but it must have been an incredible distance to travel that quickly and to stop on a dime and then redirect and disappear. My son was too young at the time to think much of it. I had heard from the wacky world of UFO conspiracies that UFOs can tell if you notice them, and I had always thought that that was baloney. But I have to admit, this thing tore off the second I noticed it and said something out loud. Pretty weird stuff. When I was four years old, I was living in Australia, Gold Coast to be exact. I don't remember much at all about that age, which is pretty normal, but there is this one thing that keeps coming back into my mind to this very day. This wasn't just some nightmare the kids usually have. I was wide awake, and I remember I felt everything that happened. I was put to bed by my parents sometime during the night. They left the room and I was all by myself. I remember trying to fall asleep, but I was suddenly interrupted by some creepy figure. I remember being pulled off my bed and dragged underneath the bed by my arms. I couldn't move at all and I was unable to speak. I remember seeing this very dark figure with bright eyes holding on to me. From that point on, I can't remember what happened. 
I don't know what that was or how it even happened. I'm pretty sure it was some kind of sleep paralysis. But if you have any idea, let me know. I was 10 years old. My brother and I were the last ones off the bus from school every day. We were nearing my house, which is in the Midwest countryside. Lots of cows and trees and fields, stuff like that. Anyway, about a mile away from my house, I look out the window and I see an orange blimp in the sky. Standard American football shaped blimp. Surprisingly, I didn't think anything of it because a day or so before that, a bunch of kids and I at recess saw a blue blimp in the sky. I watched it, thought it was cool to see a blimp this far outside of town, especially near my house, and wasn't about to think another thing of it. After a few seconds, the blimp shifted from a football shape to a star, literally just shrunk before my eyes into a tiny, shiny dot that resembled a star in the night sky except it wasn't a star. It was just a blimp a second ago. Not even two seconds after it shifted, it launched even farther into the sky, shot down to its original height, and then shot completely off into space. It was the most bizarre thing I had ever experienced. I was a quiet kid, but being the last kid on the bus besides my brother, I shouted about it. When I got off the bus, I ran to my mother to tell her, like a crazy old man yelling about the end times. My mother said that I was crazy, naturally, and I never told my dad, because my mom shut me down pretty hard and it killed my mood. Fast forward years later, shortly after I turned 22, my dad and I took a short road trip to go pick up a car he bought halfway across the state. We talked about a lot and somehow got on the topic of UFOs. He told me that when he was 12 or 13, he and his brothers were playing down by a creek near their house, which by the way, was only a few miles away from our house. They saw an orange football shaped object in the sky. I was absolutely blown away when he said that. My father's skeptical and doesn't believe in this kind of stuff, ever. But when I shared my story, he paused and said that it was very odd to have seen the exact same thing behave the exact same way more than 30 years apart. When I was 17, my 13-year-old sister died. I was moved out and living in Michigan at the time, and she was living with our mother in Texas. She and a friend that was staying the night with her snuck out to meet her friend's boyfriend. And at 1.50 a.m. in the middle of downtown, she was struck by an oncoming train and died. A little side note that I find strange is that that night, I had the feeling that something was coming. I was too afraid to sleep I left the light on all night and I pushed my mattress far to one side so that I could line the bed frame with my crystals and hopefully protect myself from whatever was coming. I messaged a few of my friends even, telling them to stay safe. It never crossed my mind that my younger sister was in danger. At 5 a.m., I'm up watching TV with my roommate and my mom calls. She asks if I'm sitting down. I run into my room and sit, and I ask her what's up. She tells me that Nan is dead and explains what happened. I swear my soul left my body for a moment. I heard my own screams like I was underwater. I barely remember the rest of the day, but I was able to go pack and I was on my way to Texas in a plane very early the next morning. I listened to how it's going to be on repeat for the whole ride. When I finally made it to my mom's, I bypassed everybody and went into my sister's room and sat on her bed, soaking up the last of her scent. The week was a blur. I held my mother, wrote the obituary, 
My older sisters and I planned her memorial. I wove together a crown of flowers from our yard for her to wear while she was cremated. I don't think any of us ate a single morsel of food, despite loving community members pummeling us with casseroles. Exactly seven days after her death, nearly to the minute, my older sisters and I were hiding behind the garage sharing a smoke. There was a light directly above us, illuminating the space we were in, and shrouding the rest of the farm in an even blacker darkness. Suddenly I hear, Josie's on a vacation far away, come around and talk it over. So many things that I want to say. You know I like my girls a little bit older. Quietly at first, we all joined in for the chorus, confirming that they heard this song as well, and the next verse was louder. We joined in for the chorus again, and she's louder still, surrounding us. It sounded like she was singing from the darkness, directly next to the garage, and inching closer with every word. She sings the entire song, and then suddenly my sisters take off running and I follow. It's strange, I was scared. I mean, I was sure it was my sister, and yet I felt fearful. We all run inside and stand in the dimly lit living room, talking over what just happened. Two of my sisters swear that it was my mother singing on top of our old windmill, so the sound was traveling. My other sister and I swear it was Nan. One of my sisters creeps upstairs to check on my mother, and she's fast asleep. At this point, we all run outside, shrieking Nan's name into the dark, trying to get her to come back. She doesn't. We googled the song lyrics, and they were just absolutely perfect for expressing what she was trying to. She sang the whole thing, loud and clear. It still rocks me whenever I think about it. Absolutely crazy and unbelievable. I was never sure whether I should believe in the paranormal or not. Sure, I'd heard strange noises home alone at night, or felt the energy in the house shift to something more sinister in a matter of seconds. But what I experienced in August of 2021 convinced me. It's taken a long time to process what I had experienced. I've mostly tried to pretend that it didn't happen. And to be honest, I really wish it hadn't. For context, last August, I had moved into the guest bedroom in our basement. I'm 15, and having the entire basement to myself for most of the day and all night was awesome. I immediately began to regret my decision though, as I discovered how unsettling the energy in my basement is. It's really hard to explain, but it just feels off, especially at night. I was literally always on edge whenever I was down there. Sleeping was quite difficult as I was never really calm. I often felt an overwhelming presence watching over me, and I was really hating my decision. But I knew my mom would be upset if I changed my mind so soon, so I endured the hell I was living in. I quickly need to describe the layout of my basement so you can understand where everything is taking place. Once you enter my basement, there's a large living area. Attached to that is a hallway that leads to where I've been sleeping. So I woke up at around one to two in the morning to the sounds of about four voices in the living area of the basement. I could never actually make out what they were talking about, maybe because I had just woken up, but I'm pretty sure they were speaking in another language or maybe very broken English. As I was listening to the voices, I heard quiet footsteps approaching my door. The only way that I was sure they were footsteps was because the floor in our basement, especially in the hallway, is very creaky. I pulled the covers over my head and shut my eyes. I fell asleep almost immediately and nothing else happened that night. I've also felt people touch me in the basement, but usually those experiences are comforting. 
I usually believe that to be my father, who passed away in 2015, as I've only felt those when I'm sad or angry. Still paranormal, but unrelated to the experience I just told you about. Either way, that experience in the basement terrified me. And I'm still not sure how to explain it. I was hunting for black bear one day, back in the early 2000s. The area I was hunting in was northern Clinton County. My ex-brother-in-law and I enjoyed the area and spent many a season scouting and hunting these lands. This part of the country is filled with long hollows, steep inclines, and hard to access trails. We both like to do our own thing and hunt separate terrains. I would often dive down into the hollows while he scoured the ridgelines, hoping to get a shot at whatever I pushed over the tops. We both carried pretty bumped up two-way radios to keep a general idea where we were, although often the terrain made it too difficult for good reception. This day was a typical Pennsylvania bear season day. It was on the Wednesday of the season, third and last day of the brief season it was back then. The woods were quiet with no distant whooping and yodeling of various opening day camps pushing drives through the woods. The weather was cold, gray, and windy when we separated to begin our hunt and continued on throughout the day. I spent the day still hunting down this long hollow, south of a little town in north central Clinton County, with the idea of meeting my brother-in-law at the top of a ridge at the agreed upon time of 4 p.m giving us plenty of time to hike together the few miles back to his truck. After hunting all day, I found an old game trail that appeared to meander its way back up to the ridge line toward where I knew he would be waiting. After close to an hour, maybe 3.30, I made my way two-thirds of the way to the top. Stopping often, I scoured the slope for that jet-black fur of a roaming bear. Along the trail, I came upon a long-ago used fire ring. It was very rudimentary in its build, and appeared to be used only once. The ring's rocks were covered in lichen, and only had the faintest of traces of black from a long-ago fire. I found it odd that a fire ring would be here, considering the steepness of the slope, but it was a very small, somewhat leveled edge. There I figured I would sit and eat the rest of my packed food, and sit still, hoping to catch a final chance to see a bear. All the while, it felt odd, somewhat unwelcoming, like I shouldn't be there. Almost felt like I was a forbidden interloper on someone's valued spot. I sat for maybe 20 minutes, and then thought that it was time to continue the trek upward toward my buddy. As I stood, I slung my backpack on and reached down to sling my rifle over my left shoulder. As I stood up, I heard my name called loudly. It didn't really sound like it was behind me, rather all around in my head. Just as I was going to turn around, my rifle was slapped off of my shoulder. I felt the force, heard the sound of something slap against the wood of the stock, and I crouched quickly to save my gun from dashing onto the rocks at my feet. I grabbed it in the nick of time, and quickly turned around with a mouthful of profanities for whoever I thought was going to be my brother-in-law, joking with me. There was nobody there at all. There was absolutely no way that anyone had rushed off without me either seeing or hearing them. I felt a sick feeling in my churning stomach. Chills went all over my body. I muttered a few Hail Marys and sped up to the top of the ridge, met my bud, and quickly we hiked our way out of the woods to his truck in the spreading dark of the evening. This event has bothered me for years, and I've never been back in those particular woods since. Someday, I hope to. Maybe. I was off-roading with some buddies back home in eastern New Brunswick 
on the Bay of Fundy. There's this trail we go on that ends on the water, and it's at the site of an old ammunition depot from World War II. We've been here many times during the day, and sometimes at night. You can drive into and through this massive old structure, and up the hill is the admin building for this site. It's pretty far into the woods. At the very top of that hill are some grave markers from hundreds of years ago. We were told that they were old private graves. We live on the coast, not at all something that I would doubt being a real thing. We were in there one night in the big building having a fire, and we all saw and heard something quite large scramble up the side of the building and then start running on top of it. Now, there are a dozen of us there, so it's clearly not just one person seeing something crazy. There is nothing in the woods of Eastern Canada that should be able to climb as quickly as what we saw. A black bear, maybe. But this thing basically ran up the side of a four-story tall structure and then ran across the top of it in moments. Needless to say, we got in our trucks and hightailed it out of there. On another occasion, we were exploring the admin building, which is three stories tall. It's concrete and it's been abandoned since World War II. We go all the way to the top. Nothing weird happens. But as we're coming back, we notice something weird on the second floor. An entire room is filled with lit candles, but there's nobody around whatsoever. We ran out of there so fast. This one, I will admit, could have been an elaborate prank, since lots of people would go and mess around there since it was a fun off-road trail with some history. But the thing that climbed up the building, to this day, that still mystifies me. In 2017, one of my good friends lived in Portland, Oregon. He was offered a job in Long Island, New York, and took it. He asked me to fly out so I could road trip with him across the country so he wouldn't be alone. Of course, I agreed and flew out from JFK to PDX. We have many stories from this road trip, but none stranger than what happened to us in Ohio. After a few days on the road, we had entered Ohio. I wish I remember exactly where this took place, but I honestly don't recall. All I know is that it was past Zanesville, heading east, where we had stayed the night before. My buddy was driving as I was reaching toward the ground, trying to grab my phone that I had dropped. He suddenly said, This old lady next to us keeps pointing at me. I think she wants me to pull over. I, always paranoid, said, F that dude, keep driving. But he pulled over. A black Escalade with plates from Alaska pulled in front of us. Out hopped a woman, no younger than 60, and said, I'm glad I got to you boys when I did. Your tires are smoking. It's important to note that we were towing his Camry with the U-Haul we were in. Side note, what happened in Zanesville was that we got stuck in the parking lot, couldn't back up, so we had to rehitch his car. We realized later he had left the emergency brakes on. Anyway... After she said this, we looked at each other, completely puzzled, and immediately at the tires. They were absolutely smoking, looking like they had bullet holes in them. This is where it gets strange. Not even a few seconds after we kneeled down to inspect the tires, she was gone. No goodbye, no sound of a car pulling off, just gone. The whole interaction from her getting out of the car to her vanishing couldn't have been more than 15 seconds in duration. I didn't have a doubt in my mind that she had literally vanished. My friend looked at me pale as a ghost, confirming exactly what I was thinking. I don't know for sure what would have happened if we hadn't stopped. I don't know if the car would have caught fire or anything else. But I do know that, real or not, to us she was an angel. I've tried to look into stories like this, but haven't had any luck finding anything. 
What do you think? For some background, this happened back in the 80s. I was between 9 and 10. I was an only child at this point and my mother was a single mom. She had taken all the money that she had and bought a trailer and some land and moved out to the country. I can still remember how she installed the septic system, installed the plumbing and an electrical pole and how we wired that to the house. This had given me great fascination with electricity. I was always helping her with these projects. I grew up knowing a lot more than most kids about these kinds of things. We lived in a rural area in East Texas on a two-acre tract of land. Houses were sparse and situated quite far apart, so not a heavily populated area. I was a lonely kid for the most part living out there, but I digress. I'll move on to the day they came. My mom was busy with something in her room, which was situated at the far end of the 72-foot trailer we lived in. I went to the kitchen for something and heard a knock at the door. I went to open it and found four kids standing outside, two boys and two girls. I opened the screen door and the larger of the boys asked, can we use your phone? We need to call our mom. I was immediately suspicious because where had these kids come from? I lived here a few years and knew all the kids in the neighborhood. I remember looking at the larger boy's eyes and thinking something was different about him, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I shrugged and opened the screen wider and let them in. I left the front door open as I took them into the kitchen and pointed to where the phone was. The larger boy picked up the phone as my mom called to me. I ran into my mom's room and she said, who's in the house? I told her a bunch of kids wanted to use the phone. She looked angry and said, you don't let anyone in the house. Tell them to leave. I walked out of her room and back to the kitchen to tell them that they had to go and found the phone off the hook. The front door was still open and the screen door was closed. I ran to the door and outside to look for the kids, but they were nowhere to be found. They couldn't have had time to walk or run across two acres to get to the street. So, where were they? After that happened, life was super weird. Mom was always getting sick, unable to find sustainable work, and became heavily paranoid. She got into damaging relationships with men. Of the most weird occurrences were when she didn't have the ability to pay the phone bill. So the phone company came and disconnected the phone. However, we kept getting calls. I rarely ever answered the phone. So when my mom told me this, I was skeptical and I didn't really believe her. Then one day she was busy outside and the phone rang, so I answered it. I heard a woman say hello on the other end. It sounded just like my aunt and then it all just went to static. When my mom came back in, I told her what had occurred. So she went to a neighbor's and called the phone company to ask them to check the line that our phone was still ringing. They came out, inspected the line and the pole and came inside and told my mom, there's no way you're getting phone calls. The line is completely disconnected. It's cut at the pole. This happened constantly, even after my mom moved the trailer to another city. In that city, she had failed to pay the bill again and again we kept getting phone calls that ended in dead air or strange voices or static. Their linesman told her the same thing that there was no way our phone was ringing, but yet it was. To this day, I really don't know what to make of any of that, but it was also around this time that I began to experience things like words of knowledge, clairaudient experiences where I would know things that I had never learned and I would hear things just before they happened in physical reality. I mostly kept those experiences to myself and I would just think, how weird. When mom sold that trailer, we never had those weird phone experiences again, and the clairaudience also went away. There were a few other weird occurrences too. While still living in the country, I was sitting on my mom's bed next to her. She was saying, it feels like there's bugs crawling all over me. I got off the bed and walked over to her dresser, and for some reason, 
I felt the need to look up. On the ceiling, there were tons of tiny spiders. I am not exaggerating when I say there could have been millions of itsy bitsy tiny little spiders. I knew my mom would freak out, so I just said, Mom, please get up and leave the room. She looked at me with a look of concern and asked why. I said, just trust me, get out of the room. She then gave me a look like I was simply being impossible, so finally I said, look up. I have never seen her leave a room so fast after she looked up and saw that mess. Literal arachnophobia. We fumigated the house directly after that several times a year. It could be unrelated, but I've never seen anything like that before or since. After we'd moved the trailer to another city, some lights would either dim or get brighter and brighter when we turned them on until they literally popped. When mom called the electric company, they sent an electrician out to inspect. He climbed the pole, and when he went to test one of the lines, it literally popped him off the pole and he flew to the ground. He was okay, though a little shocked, pun intended, and shaken. The electric company's stance on the issue was that there was a miswiring at the pole. It was most likely that they missed the ground. Again, could be unrelated, but the circuit breakers never tripped during these episodes. In hindsight, it was all just really, really weird. It might seem stupid, but this sound has bugged me since the day I first heard it back in May. I could swear that I've never heard anything like this. I went with my dog in a pretty offhand natural reserve in Italy for a walk. This one is a particular reserve. It's not like a park. It's wild and no human activity is allowed, except for monitoring and hiking in specific days of the month. It's because it's the habitat of a very rare bird, but I can't remember which one. This means that I was basically alone with my dog, but still, it was a super sunny day and the place isn't dangerous at all. No slopes, no hard paths, only a very big river. And if you avoid getting super close to it, you'll have no problems with it. Everything was great until lunch. While eating, out of nowhere, I started to hear this very strange noise coming from multiple directions in the woods. Now, it was super weird since I've read all the info of the reserve and it says that whenever they make monitoring operations, they deny access. And I was pretty sure that I was the only person there. This place only has one entrance and it's totally surrounded by a swamp. There are no cars except for mine and not a soul out there. The closest structure is about 25 kilometers away from that place. My dog started to bark and became so nervous that I had to calm her down for a while. Something like this has never happened before. My dog, a lab, has heard many noises in the woods even louder than this one, but has never gotten nervous. I'll try to explain what the sound was like. The best way I can describe it is that it was like a loud metallic bang, like when you hit a stick against a metallic can, immediately followed by the sound of an engine failing. Like when you try to start an old tractor and it won't. It occurred three or four times per minute and lasted about seven to eight seconds each time. The noise made my dog and I very uneasy. I don't know why. I'm used to hiking in the woods, even at night. And in my life, I've heard much scarier sounds, like thunder and lightning striking close to the ground, very close to my house. But this one was somehow dreadful. It made me and my dog freak out. So I decided to pack everything up, head back to the car, and leave the area as soon as possible. The noise never stopped. It continued to occur in the same way I described it, 
And there's another weird thing. It always sounded very close. No matter where I went or how far I parked my car, around an hour of hiking from the spot I first heard it, it always sounded like it was the same distance away, like it was following us, maintaining about 30 meters of distance. My dog calmed down and fell asleep only when we were in the car and halfway back home. I felt super tired too, as soon as I calmed down, and I barely managed the drive to my home, trying not to fall asleep the whole way. That evening, I had a massive headache and felt very off. So I immediately drifted to bed. In your opinion, what was that? I didn't cross anyone to ask them on the reserve or at the office. It was closed that day. Nobody has ever been able to tell me what produced that noise. Plus, as I said, the reserve is super close to a river and a swamp. Maybe those things are connected. What do you think? The woods behind my house have always been odd. About a year ago, I had an encounter with something. To this day, I don't know what, but I know it's back and I know it wants me. Things were quiet. We started to all forget about the mystery woodland encounter from last year. For the most part, my girlfriend and I had moved on from it. That was until two months ago on a cold February morning. My girlfriend discovered that one of our chicken's legs had been snapped in half. I took her to the vet and they were as confused as I was. There was no sign of any attack or any clear indication of who or what had done this. They recommended that I put her down, but I just couldn't do it. I believed that maybe with some rehab and a safe environment, she would heal. I took her home and I put her in the pool house. I went about my days thinking nothing of it. To this day, she hops around on one foot, but she's thriving. Anyway, a week goes by and I come out one morning to find another chicken that had both legs snapped clean in half. I ran over as fast as I could to find a similar situation. There was no sign of attack or any blood to be found. I took her to the vet and unfortunately, I had to put her down. At this point, I had a chilling feeling as to what might be going on here. I think it's back. The next day, I set up cameras facing those woods. I spent $700 on the best trail cams and the most well-reviewed SD cards I could find, and I was determined to capture it this time. I made a rule that I would check them every day, twice a day, so as not to miss anything. Every time, I would find nothing. Just some cats and my chickens doing animal stuff. Since we found that first chicken, I haven't been able to sleep. I've had night terrors, nightmares, and sleep paralysis almost every night. I kept having a dream about the woods. Something chasing me. Something attacking me or getting lost in there. I'm constantly on edge, and it seems like every noise makes me jump. Yesterday morning, I went to check the cameras. They're gone. They're just gone. I was baffled and in utter disbelief. I hid these cameras so well that not even my girlfriend could find them. And yet, they're gone. I searched everywhere for these things. Every inch of my yard, every nook and cranny of the house and pool house. There is no trace of them. Angry, confused, and upset, I put on my boots, a thick jacket, and I headed into the woods. I was determined to figure out what this thing was and what it wanted with me. Remember now, those woods are dense and thick. Everything is overgrown and muddy, or so I thought. 
I push my way through vines and bushes, around trees and stumps, and I stumbled upon something I wish I had never found. A clearing. I stopped for a moment to try to understand what I was looking at. I wish I could share some kind of satellite view to prove that this clearing can't possibly exist. But then it dawned on me. Where the hell am I? How long have I been walking? Did I go the wrong way? Am I lost? Amongst all my confusion, something catches my eye. It's one of my trail cams smashed on the ground. How the hell did this end up here? It was at this time that I realized how absolutely silent it was. I mean, I could hear my own heart beating. Reality set in and I had the immediate urge to run as fast as I could in the opposite direction. This is where I'm at a complete loss. I took what I thought was maybe a hundred steps through some dense vines and brush, and there I was, at the back of my property. It felt like it took a minute or two of scrambling to get through the thick overgrowth, and I was back. Still absolutely panicking, I continued onward until I got to the back door. I bolted the door and locked myself in the bedroom. I haven't said a word to anyone today. I called out of work, and it's been about 18 hours, and all I can think about is going back in. I'm scared, I can't sleep, and somehow I know that it's watching me through my bedroom window. I just went out for a walk before bed. I saw what I thought were very close shooting stars a couple of times. The third or fourth time I saw it, I gasped because I noticed that there were different colored lights coming from some kind of flying object. Then I saw it zoom off, leaving the very bright shooting star kind of trail behind it. It was there for a split second, but I saw it. Very bright, it quickly descended from the sky right by my house. I rushed inside and looked out a window, and I saw it zoom off again away from me. The things I'm seeing lately, it's getting harder to deny their presence. I know it's not the longest story, but I've been seeing strange things a lot, and I'm pretty sure they're aliens. Some friends and I ventured into an old abandoned hospital that's pretty securely boarded up. We climbed through a broken window that was maybe eight inches at most. It was nighttime and most of the large hospital campus is abandoned with welded doors and boarded windows. And though people had obviously gotten in before us, there was much less graffiti and damage than we're used to seeing in these places. The campus has several buildings, and we were clueless as to which one we were in, until we found a morgue in the basement, and medical equipment strewn about. We didn't hear anything or see anything out of the ordinary, except for the light in the attic. The building had no power, yet we could see from the top floor that a light was on above us. We couldn't get into the attic, as the only staircase up there had a chained and bolted door. It was a little odd, but I'm not sure if it was paranormal. Maybe there was a solar-powered light? Would the bulb ever go out? I don't know. It didn't scare us off. We did continue wandering around for a while, but nothing crazy happened. Still, sometimes I think about that light in the attic and I try to figure out what could have caused it, but I still haven't come up with a sufficient explanation. Last night, I had a really weird experience, but at least somehow it has a positive ending. 
It was like 2.20 a.m. To be honest, nothing felt wrong until I opened my eyes. I was half asleep, but I could clearly see the typical gray alien head behind a chair that's close to my bed. Well, nearly all of its face. I couldn't move at all. In fact, I tried so hard to move that my right leg started to shake because of my effort. It looked kind of ghostly. It wasn't fully defined and it was whitish, but the face was basically an alien. I couldn't see the body. The head, which was huge by the way, was at my bed's height, so it was probably crawling or something? I don't know. The moment I opened my eyes, I wanted to do something. Battle it, get rid of it, something. I used all of my strength to move. I could see this thing because I often sleep with my lamp on. If I turn it off, I start to imagine them all around me. I don't know why. Without that lamp, I never would have seen a thing. I simply could not move. My body would not respond. So I started to pray, saying, Jesus Christ protects me. Jesus Christ sets me free. Don't let it take me. All of a sudden it vanished and I could move. After that, I stood awake for a while, but I didn't get out of my bed. I was too exhausted from trying to fight this thing. I just kept thinking about it and looking at the same spot while I was spooked out. I'm not even a Christian, nor do I practice any religion, but I do know that Jesus' name freed me from this thing. You could probably consider me an atheist, but what happened, happened. So I am open to the fact that spiritual things exist. From what I've read from a few reports on the internet, several people have been set free from abductions, alien encounters, and so on, praying to God. I really don't know what to think about that, but it happened to me too. Before this encounter, the last two days, there have been two full power cuts throughout the neighborhood, one each day. A short one during the first day around 11 a.m., and a fairly long one the other day at like 2 a.m. Has anybody else experienced anything like this? All I know is I hope to never experience it again. I know this story is probably the most cliché, horror movie plot sounding thing in the world, but I assure you that it's 100% real. For reference, this happened in 2013. There's this family that I babysit for. They go to church with my folks and are truly the nicest people I've ever met. They're devout, non-denominational Christians and they don't believe in ghosts or spirits or even demons really, just as a background. They also live in the boondocks of suburban Georgia. I mean, they're not too far away from civilization, maybe five minutes to the nearest 7-Eleven, but they're far enough removed from society that you can't see their house from the nearest paved road. The dad's a contractor. He bought the land and built the place himself. It's actually really nice, but it's in the middle of the forest, which makes the place creepy from the get-go but I digress. The house itself is a one-story ranch style. The front door opens into the living area and the bedrooms are off down the hall to your left. The kitchen and dining area is to your right and beyond that, the garage. The first and only time I stepped foot into the place was August of 2013. Like I said, we live in Georgia, so it feels like Satan's armpit outside, but the house is freezing. Not air conditioning cold either. It's that unnerving, bone chilly kind of cold that no amount of blankets can rectify. I actually checked the thermostat a few times during my stay, and it was set on 76. My teeth shouldn't have been chattering. Something else that's weird, and I feel like it ought to be mentioned before we get started proper, it's dark in the house. Even with the lights on, it's hard to see into the next room and that's in broad daylight. 
At night, it's even worse. I never really understood how they lived there. I'm not one for sunny days, but I do like to see where I'm going. Anyway, so the parents leave for wherever they were headed, and the kids, a boy about six and a girl about three, are fed, washed, and in bed by 8.30. Now I'm left to my own devices, and I end up channel surfing. For a while, maybe an hour, everything is hunky-dory. And then I hear the garage door open. A minute later, I hear the back door, the door that leads from the kitchen into the garage, open and shut, and footsteps wander around the kitchen. The kitchen floor is made of stonework, so it has a pretty distinct sound when it's trod upon, especially by dress shoes. My first thought was, oh, they're home early, fantastic. So I turned the TV off, straightened up the couch where I had been lounging, and prepared to greet them. But I look down the hallway, and it's dark. All the lights are off at that end of the house. Now, if you look down the hallway, you can see into the kitchen, but you're looking directly at the door that leads to the garage. There's nobody there. Nobody opened the garage door, and nobody is in the kitchen. Meaning that nobody just made a hell of a lot of noise that I can't explain. So I'm freaked, but I do the thing that everybody does. I go to check it out just to make sure. Except that uh, I flipped on light switches because I've seen enough horror movies to know that wandering around in the pitch darkness is no bueno. I checked everything out. Nada. Door's still locked. Garage hasn't budged. Now I know I heard what I heard. I'm pretty sure it wasn't something in the show that I was watching. I legitimately thought the parents were home. Whatever. I shake it off and settle back down again. Maybe my mind is playing tricks on me. Isn't that what everybody says the first time something weird happens? Another 15 minutes go by and I'm engrossed in one of the Harry Potter movies when, during a lull in the film, I hear it again. Garage door, back door opening and shutting, footsteps in the kitchen. Only this time it's accompanied by voices. I mute Harry and look over the back of the couch fully expecting to see Ma and Pa strolling into the living room. Of course, there's nothing there. After maybe a minute, the voices disappear. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but there were definitely at least two, and one of them was definitely male. Once again, I get up and go look in the kitchen, flicking on lights as I go. This time, I'm greeted by something new. The refrigerator door is standing wide open. They have one of those fancy stainless steel gizmos and the thing swinging back and forth like a leaf in the wind. Now this is haunting 101, right? Every ghost learns to stomp around noisily and open doors on their first day, I guess. But this thing had a childproof locking mechanism on it. Great. So now ghosts can not only open doors, they can solve complex tasks to accomplish the feat. I shut the fridge and wander back down the hallway again but I don't get into the living area good before it sounds like all hell's broken loose in the kitchen. It's kind of hard to describe the loudness of this noise. It was as if every piece of china these people owned had been taken out of the cupboards and hurled to the ground simultaneously, ceramic shattering against stone. Well, great, now I'm in trouble. Casper's gone and destroyed the flatware and I'm going to be blamed for it. I run back down the hallway, but the kitchen is in order, not the remotest sign of damage. The noise wakes up the kids, and they come out of their rooms rubbing their eyes asking me what's happened. My skin is crawling, but I don't want to upset them. So I lie, and I tell them that I'm sorry, but it was just something on TV, and that the noise got a little louder than I expected. The boy buys the fib. He toddles off back to bed like a good little soldier, but the girl isn't so convinced. In fact, she looks directly past me, down the hallway to the kitchen, as if she knows exactly what it was that woke her up. She sees that I've muted the Chamber of Secrets and asks if she can stay with me for a while, just until she feels like she can go back to sleep. I'm freaked out enough at this point to agree, 
Having a three-year-old for company is better than none at all, right? So together we settle back on the couch. She ends up curling up right next to me and nodding off in a matter of minutes. For a while, things are peaceful. The movie ends and I'm sitting there watching the credits scroll and listening to the theme music when, for no apparent reason, the fireplace next to the TV bursts into flames. Reminder, these people live in the woods. They don't have any newfangled fancy pants gas fireplace that you would expect to see in a house in a subdivision. They use actual wood and kindling and actual matches. So while there's always the possibility that they had lit a fire and just didn't put it out all the way, please also remember that we're in Georgia in August. Nobody in their right mind burns a fire in the dog days of summer in the South. It just doesn't happen. But here I am, staring at the roaring, cozy-looking fire, and about that time, I hear the garage door again. This time, however, it's actually the parents. They come traipsing in, jangling keys and dropping their crap on the counter, turning on lights and calling out for me. Dad makes his way into the living room and notices the fire. If you were cold, you could have just adjusted the thermostat, he says. Curious, but not upset that I've apparently decided to set up camp in his living room. I tell him that I didn't start it, and that it started all on its own. He just kind of looks at me funny and mentions that they haven't used the fireplace since the winter before, so there shouldn't be any reason for it to be lit, which I already knew, but ultimately just sort of brushes it off. I figure, whatever, he's obviously got bigger balls than I do if that doesn't freak him out. The mother comes in and picks up the little girl to take her back to bed. She's still half asleep, and I can hear her tell her mom, the old man lit the fire again. Now I know she's half asleep and could very well have just been dream talking, but I somehow doubt that, and I can guarantee you that there was no old man in that house with me least not one that I could see. I don't stick around to answer any questions about why the girl was out of bed or who the old man was that she was talking about. The dad pays for my time and I dip out as quickly as I can while still being polite about it. I never went back there to babysit the kids, and just four months after my experience, they moved out of the house that the father had built from the ground up. They said it was something to do with his business, taking him into another town. Funny though, they sold it to another couple in the church, who also moved out within three months of moving in. They wouldn't talk about why, just made vague excuses when my parents asked about it. I don't know who lives there now, if anyone. When I was 17, my brother, mom, grandma, and I lived in a centennial house. With it being over a hundred years old, I figured that there had to be a ghost or two. A lot of strange occurrences happened, and I always felt like I was being watched, especially in the basement. It was a basement with four different rooms. One door opened into a storage room to the left, and a sump pump room my brother's room right across the hallway, and the other room next to his was the laundry room. One summer day we had just gotten home from a camping trip. I was thirsty and a bit hungry, so I went into the kitchen to make me something to eat. Note that my kitchen has sliding glass doors to the outside, and just right to it another door leading to the basement. I was standing at the counter when I heard my brother call my name and ask if I wanted a smoke. I'm like, yeah, where are you? The sound came very clearly from the basement, but since there's a deck outside my glass door, I figured he could have been outside. I had dark curtains, and they weren't drawn. I walk up the basement door and yell down again, asking if he's down there. No answer. I'm like, okay, fine. He'll come find me if he wants to smoke. So I walk to the front of the house, 
through my grandma's living room and into the other living room and out to the front door to our van to grab my backpack and purse. As I go outside, my brother and his girlfriend at the time were unloading the van. I asked if they had called my name and he was very confused. I told him what I had just heard and the very short conversation we had just had. He and his girlfriend both assured me that they had been outside unloading our camping stuff in the garage and hadn't been anywhere near me. It sent chills down my spine. I limited my time going downstairs from then on. I still don't know what it was. This just happened yesterday, so it's fresh in my mind. I'm not quite sure what to think of it, because it was just so bizarre and unbelievable. Maybe I was just sleep deprived. So last night at maybe 2300, I was walking around my block. My town is relatively safe, so I didn't feel in danger. Plus, it was a pretty night. I had been walking for around five minutes when a pale woman with blonde hair and a white dress caught my eye from across the street. She was about my height and looked to be around my age, too. I didn't actually pay attention to her after I first noticed her. While I circled the block again, she was on the same street, a couple of feet in front of me. She was standing on the curb, staring at the cars passing by. It was a main road, so even that late, people were still driving on it. I said hello to her and she turned her gaze toward me. I couldn't see her face super well, but from what I think I saw, she had no pupils, no color in her eyes. She just stared at me. After a while, I asked if she was okay. She didn't respond and simply pointed at the road. I was really confused and I didn't understand. Right then, a red car started coming down the road. She stepped into the road and the car slammed into her. It was a bloody mess. The driver immediately stopped and jumped out. It was a man in his mid-twenties. We both spoke about it, freaking out. He called the police and I went around the car to see the state of the girl. But once I circled around the car, she was gone. Not as in dead, gone, as in she wasn't there at all. The blood on the road was gone too, but not gone from his car. After the police arrived, they concluded that it was some kind of big hoax. A hoax by some kid who didn't know what they were talking about, and some guy who just went along with it. The blood on the truck was brought into investigation, only to be found as paint. Nothing else was put up about it. I'm still not sure if what happened was real. It felt so real, but I don't believe in the paranormal. I don't know what it was. Was it some kind of waking dream? I remember it like it was a real event. I feel like I can't leave the house now. I don't understand anything, and I kind of feel like I'm going crazy. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? This Sunday gone, my girlfriend and I, who live in Adelaide, Australia, had just gone on a dinner date. She is a 26-year-old female and I am a 24-year-old female. We went to her house to drop off her doggy bag. Then we drove back toward my house, southward. About halfway between our houses, I noticed three lights in the sky in a perfect triangle. It was very odd and the lights were fairly obvious in the dark sky, especially because there were also stars visible, so the lights were very visibly different. They were a lot brighter and bigger, though not by much. I pointed it out to her, and immediately she said, holy cow, what the heck is that? At first I thought I might be seeing things, 
But when she reacted, I knew it wasn't just my eyes playing tricks. We quickly noticed that the lights were moving at about the same speed we were and had started to flash green and red sporadically. We decided to follow it for as long as we feasibly could. It was a bit of a thrill, if I'm being completely honest, following the mystery lights in the sky, but it also didn't last very long. Maybe five minutes past my house, the lights took a turn, sped up, and just disappeared. We pulled over to see if we could find it again, but we didn't have any luck. We kept talking about how strange and cool the whole thing was. I am telling my story here to see if anyone else has seen something like this or has any ideas of what it could have been besides a UFO. Our first thought was a helicopter, but there's no realistic way for a perfect triangle of lights to come off of that, and they moved way too quickly. If anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear them.